Thank you for joining us today for Know Your Nets, the Net Research Foundation's virtual patient and caregiver educational conference. I'm Elise Gellerman, CEO of NetRF. We have a great program for you, a full day of net education based on what you told us you wanted to learn. To set the stage for Know Your Nets, we start off this morning with Nets 101. If nets are new to you or you would like a quick refresher, the next 20 minutes will be very helpful. Our speaker is Dr. Andy Liao of the University of Chicago Medicine. Dr. Liao is an assistant professor. He is a medical oncologist who specializes in treating GI neuroendocrine tumors and hepatobiliary cancers. Then after Dr. Liao's talk, we will be back to officially kick off Know Your Nets 2021. Thank you very much. My name is Andy Liao, and I'm a medical oncologist from the University of Chicago. Today, I'll be talking about NET 101, so a quick introduction to neuroendocrine tumors. So neuroendocrine tumors used to be known as carcinoid tumors, which came from the discovery of this German pathologist who found these um, slower growing tumors. Neuroendocrine tumors are tumors that arise from neuroendocrine cells. And the reason they're called neuroendocrine tumors is because they receive nerve input, that's the neural part, and they can secrete hormones, so that's the endocrine part. And it turns out that these neuroendocrine cells are present all over your body. And so neuroendocrine tumors can originate from anywhere in your body, typically classified by the embryological origin. So we classify them into four gut neuroendocrine tumors, which include thymus, esophagus, lung, stomach, small intestine, and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, including appendix, colon, neuroendocrine tumors, and then hind-gut neuroendocrine tumors, which include the lower colon and rectal neuroendocrine tumors. We also classify them by the type of hormones they secrete. So for instance, for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, you can have gastrinomas, insulinomas, glucagonomas, VIPnomas, and somatostatinomas. And we can also have neuroendocrine tumors of unknown primary origin. We also classify these neuroendocrine tumors as functional, meaning that they can cause symptoms of hormone overproduction, or non-functional, meaning that they do not cause any symptoms of hormonal overproduction. Importantly, neuroendocrine tumor cells may express something called somatostatin receptor. So this is a little receptor on the surface of the cell. And this is important both for diagnosis and also treatment, as we'll go over in a little bit. So the terminology is quite confusing. You may have heard neuroendocrine neoplasm, neuroendocrine tumor, or neuroendocrine carcinoma. So what's the difference? So we use the word neuroendocrine neoplasm as the umbrella term. Within that, we subclassify them into neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine carcinomas. This is the 2019 World Health Organization classification of neuroendocrine neoplasms. As you can see, we can classify these tumors by their grade, differentiation, KS67 and mitotic index. And you have grade one, grade two, grade three neuroendocrine tumors. And then you have grade three neuroendocrine carcinomas. And you can also have a mixed neuroendocrine and non neuroendocrine neoplasm. So, what do all of these terms mean? So tumor differentiation means how the tumor appears morphologically, meaning how aggressive the cells look. So on the left-hand side, you see a well-differentiated tumor, means that the tumor under the microscope looks very non-aggressive um, in terms of you know, their nucleus, the cytoplasm, how their DNA is packaged. On the right-hand side, you see a tumor that under the microscope looks very, very aggressive, and we call those poorly differentiated tumors. What is tumor grade? So tumor grade means how many cells are actively dividing and making copies of themselves. So we can measure that in one of two ways. So one is mitotic index. So if you go, if you remember from high school biology, you can look under the microscope and count the cells, count how many cells that are actually going through mitosis. 
Another way to measure tumor grade is by doing a stain for something called KI67. So these are some examples. So in the top left-hand corner, you see a grade one neonatal tumor where the KI67 stain highlights very few cells, meaning that very few cells are proliferating. Then on the bottom right-hand side, you have a tumor that's a grade three poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. And when you do a KS67 stain, almost all of the cells are lighting up, meaning that almost all of the cells are actively uh, growing, dividing, making copies of themselves. And within the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma category, you have large cell type and small cell type. And that just uh, refers to how the cells look under the microscope. So going back to this classification again, you can see that in general, we call the well-differentiated neoplasms, neuroendocrine tumors. And in general, we call the poorly differentiated neoplasms as neuroendocrine carcinoma. So in general, well-differentiated tumors are lower grade and that poorly differentiated tumors are higher grade. The exception is this category in the middle called a well-differentiated grade three neuroendocrine tumor. And as you can see, because there are so many different nuances in classifying neuroendocrine tumors, we really need for the patient's tumor samples to be reviewed by an experienced pathologist in order to make the correct diagnosis. What are some of the presenting symptoms of neuroendocrine tumors? The tumor can cause pain. So you can have pain from the primary tumor or you can have pain from tumors that spread to other parts of the body. For instance, you can have pain from tumors spread to the bone. The tumor can cause obstruction. So for instance, tumor in the intestine can cause intestinal obstruction. Tumors near the liver can cause bile duct obstruction. Tumors can cause bleeding, and then they can cause generalized symptoms like fatigue, weight loss, and loss of appetite. Like I said before, some of these tumors can cause over secretion of hormones and then you can get symptoms related to whichever hormone is over secreted so for example for insulinoma because the tumor secrete insulin you can then get low blood sugars um, which is what happens when you have too much insulin on board or when you have gastrinoma um, when the tumor makes gastrin you can get stomach ulcers and etc when you have vip oma when the tumor secretes vip you can have profuse watery diarrhea related to VIP secretion. And then there's something called carcinoid syndrome, which relates to some of the serotonin related byproducts that these tumors can make. And some of these symptoms include flushing, diarrhea, shortness of breath, palpitation, and etc. We know that long-standing carcinoid syndrome can affect the heart, and that can lead to what we call carcinoid heart, which can lead to heart valve problems and heart failure if severe and untreated. So how do we diagnose neuroendocrine tumors? I wanted to quickly highlight some of the different imaging modalities, because I think this is very important in diagnosis, but also in terms of planning treatment. So we generally prefer some kind of high resolution imaging like a CT scan or MRI. And these are CT and MRI from one of my patients. And as you can see, they're very, very different. So on the left-hand side, you have images from a CT scan showing the liver. On the right-hand side, you have an MRI. And on the right-hand side, the darker circles, those are the tumors. And as you can see, the MRI can really, really pick up um, very small tumors, can produce much, much clearer pictures of the liver tumors, especially, than a CT scan can. And especially if you use the right contrast for the MRI, you can really, really produce clear pictures. Another type of scan that we use is called PET scan. So PET scans are functional imaging. So one example is a dotatate PET scan, which can be done with gallium or now copper as well. So dotatate PET scan highlights tumor cells that have the somatostatin receptor. So those tumor cells that have the receptors will light up. As you can see here for my patients, um, her tumors all have the somatostatin receptor and therefore they light up brightly on the dotated PET scan. A different type of PET scan that we use is what's called an FDG PET scan. And this type of PET scan highlights tumor cells that are using a lot of energy. As we, and generally those tumor cells that are growing rapidly use a lot of energy and tend to light up. But as you know, some of these neuroendocrine tumors 
can be very, very slow growing and therefore may not use all that energy and may not light up. So this is an FGG PET scan for my patient, the same patient, and you, you can see that none of her tumors lit up on the FGG PET scan, even though we know they're there from the MRI. So it's really, really important to consider which type of scan you should order. In general, there is this spectrum where the lower the grade of the neuroendocrine tumor, the higher the expression for the somatostatin, and therefore a dota PET scan uh, is better to highlight these tumors. On the other hand of, on the spectrum, the higher the grade the tumor, the more energy they use, or the more hypermetabolic they are, um, and the less somatostatin receptor expression they have. And therefore, in higher grade tumors, an FDG PET scan may be the better choice. And in the middle category, you know, in the middle of the spectrum, you may have tumors that may lie up on both Dota Tate and FDG PET scan. So again, very important to consider what type of scan you order for your patients. Now to talk a little bit about staging. So just to talk in general terms, we think of staging in terms of anatomic stage, but also in terms of clinical stage. So by anatomic stage, I mean the traditional stage one, two, three, four. So stage one generally means localized disease. Stage two means localized, but a little bit more advanced. Stage three means generally, you know, spread to the regional lymph node. And then stage four generally means spread to other organs, such as the liver or bone. And what I mean by clinical stage is for patients with localized or regional disease, those are the patients uh, with only the primary tumor or um, tumor in the regional lymph nodes around the primary tumor. Patients may have metastatic disease, meaning widespread disease. Um, and within those, we further subclassify them as patients who have liver-limited metastatic disease, meaning cancer only spread to the liver or patients who have widely metastatic disease, meaning cancer spread all over the body. This sometimes can um, help us in terms of determining treatment options, such as liver-directed therapies. And by popular demand, I'm gonna talk a little bit about prognosis. So prognosis is always something that's very difficult to talk about because we can't predict exact prognosis of any individual patient. In general, we talk about prognosis, about numbers as a group of patients, so for instance, if you say the median prognosis is this amount of time, that means that half of the patient are going to live longer than that, and then half of the patients are gonna live shorter than that. That being said, let's look at what the data have shown us about prognosis in neuroendocrine tumor patients. So this is data from the SEER database collected between 1973 and 2012. And this database included almost 65,000 patients. So this included neuroendocrine tumors from all sites, such as the digestive tract, the lung, and et cetera, and it even included neuroendocrine tumors of unknown primary origin. And then they also looked at the grade of these neuroendocrine tumors. So grade one and grade two, these are generally the well-differentiated tumors. And then grade three or grade four are the tumors with undifferentiated features. And so some general um, points to, to highlight is that Generally, tumors um, that are localized or regional have better prognosis than tumors that have distant metastatic disease. And also in general, tumors that are lower grade have better prognosis than tumors that are higher grade. And if you can see here, it seems that tumors of the appendix and of, of the rectum have a slightly better prognosis than tumors arising from the pancreas or from the lung. Some specific information to highlight. In this study, the prognosis for rectal neurodegenerative tumors was 24 years. For appendix was greater than 30 years. For pancreas was 3.6 years, and for lung was 5.5 years. Remember, this study included both low-grade and high-grade tumors. Other things to highlight in this study, in grade, for grade one tumors, the prognosis was 16 years, grade two, 8.3 years, and for patients who have poorly differentiated, so the higher grade and poorly differentiated disease, prognosis is only measured in months. Looking across the spectrum of neuroendocrine neoplasms, some of the best prognoses are in grade one rectal cancers and grade one and grade two appendix cancers, both of which have a prognosis greater than 30 years. And some of the poorest prognoses are patients who have poorly differentiated colon neuroendocrine carcinoma in this study, median survival only eight months. And then highlighting 
um, the patients with grade one and grade two neuroendocrine tumors with widespread disease. So this is what it shows in general, prognosis is still measured in years, and it can range you know, between a couple of years to many, many years, even approaching decades. And here also are the five-year survival rates. So like I said, again, we can never predict the exact prognosis of any individual patients. And there's always a lot of different variables that are going on. And also remember the data that I've shown you, the data cutoff was in 2012. So this is before some of the modern therapies like PRRT became widely available for neuroendocrine tumor patients. And finally, this data is kind of a one size fits all data, which encompasses the entire heterogeneity across different neuroendocrine neoplasms but it can give us a rough idea in general terms of what to expect. Now, moving on to talk about treatment strategies for neuroendocrine tumors. So the first principle is that in general, for patients with poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma, we tend to use cytotoxic chemotherapy. And now there is also emerging data for immunotherapy. For patients who have this unique entity known as a well-differentiated grade 3 neuroendocrine tumor, the management is still controversial because this is a relatively new entity and we don't have a lot of data to guide us as to how we treat these. But in general, we approach them as to how they behave. So for tumors that have an unfavorable biology, meaning fast growing, then we tend to treat the poorly differentiated tumors with subtoxic chemotherapy or perhaps immunotherapy. For tumors that have a more favorable biology, meaning slower growing ones, then we may treat them more like the well differentiated low grade neuroendocrine tumors. For the rest of the talk, I'll focus just on giving a very brief overview of treatment for well differentiated grade one and grade two neuroendocrine tumors. So, one principle is that some patients can be safely observed without any treatment. In general, these are the patients who have very little cancer in their body, so low tumor burden, um, who have slow growing tumors and who have no symptoms from their tumors. For patients who do need treatment, if the disease is localized, then surgery by resecting the primary tumor can be potentially curative. But even when patients have metastatic disease, there may still be a role for surgery of the primary tumor and also for debulking surgery of liver metastases. And Dr. Koiken and some of our other speakers will talk more in detail about this. There's also liver-directed treatments. There's something called ablation, which is um, sticking a needle in and burning out the tumor with microwave and etc. There's also embolization, which is going in through the blood supply of the tumors in the liver, and then either cutting off the blood supply or putting radiation or chemo beads. And Dr. Ahmed and other speakers um, in our symposium will talk in more detail about this. And finally, there's systemic therapy, so treatments that treat the entire body. So some examples include somatosin analogs, such as octreotide and lanreotide. There's PRRT, which is peptide receptor radionuclear therapy, which is a targeted form of radiation treatment that targets the somatosin receptors. We have targeted therapies that target specific cellular pathways that the tumor cells hijack to help them grow, such as um, Everlimus, which targets the mTOR pathway. And then we have traditional chemotherapy, such as capsadabine and temozolomide that we use in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patients. So to summarize, treating neuroendocrine tumor takes a whole team. So there's role for not just oncologists and surgeons and radiation oncologists, but also nuclear medicine physicians, pathologists in helping us make the right diagnosis, radiology to help us review the imaging to make sure that we are on the right treatment approach, interventional radiologists who can help us with local regional treatments, but also nursing, dietitian, palliative care, psychiatry that can help us take care of the whole patient. That's the end of our talk today, and thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Liao, for NETS 101. We are so excited that all of you can join us today for Know Your NETS, the NET Research Foundation's virtual patient and caregiver educational conference. We would much prefer to see you all in person and share your stories face to face, but we also know that staying safe and being cautious during these unpredictable days is the best choice.
So you can attend this program from the comfort of your home with a cup of coffee or tea this morning. If this is your first NetRF educational conference, welcome. If you have been to our conferences before, thank you so much for coming back. Our mission at NetRF is twofold, to fund scientific research in nets to increase our understanding of net biology and treatment, and to provide educational resources to people with neuroendocrine tumors and their families. We have a great program for you, a full day of net education based on what you told us you wanted to learn about. We're proud of the expert speakers who have volunteered their time. You will also have the opportunity to meet several NetRF grantees who will share their research with you during a few short breaks in our program today. Now we would like to thank all of our sponsors for their great support of this program. Our co-sponsor, University of Chicago Medicine, and our educational sponsors, Ibsen, Novartis, Tercera, Crinetics, Hutchmed, and Lanthius. Now it is my pleasure to introduce my co-chair for Know Your Nets, Dr. Xavier Koikin of University of Chicago Medicine. I want to thank him for his collaboration and terrific work on this conference. Dr. Koikin is an associate professor of surgery. He's a surgical oncologist with particular expertise in treating neuroendocrine, thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal tumors. Dr. Koitkin is the director of the University of Chicago Neuroendocrine Tumor Center and works closely with a multidisciplinary team that specializes in nets. Please join me to give a virtual welcome to Dr. Koitkin. So thank you very much, uh, Elise, for this kind introduction. I'm really happy to be your co-chair today for the second year in a row um, for the uh, Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation virtual conference. We have an um, outstanding program today. Uh, the University of Chicago Medicine uh, is proud uh, to be a co-sponsor of this program. And we uh, would also like to thank um, all the um, educational co-sponsors for the support. We truly have an outstanding group of speakers today for you. And we'll start right away with Thor half Danison. Dr. Hav Danison is a professor of oncology at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and a consultant in uh, medical um, oncology. He specializes in GI oncology with a focus on neuroendocrine tumors. He serves as the chair of the GI tumor group and is the co-chair of the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor board. Dr. Hav Danison is also a member of the NCCN guideline panels for NETS um, and is on the board of directors for the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. He's going to discuss what's new in NETS in medicine. I'm really excited to have Thor he is here. He's a very good friend of mine, and we're looking forward to his speech. Thanks for the introduction, and again, thanks for inviting me to speak at this conference. My name is Thor Heft Anderson. I'm a professor of oncology at Mayo Clinic. And I was going to talk to you about what is new in neuroendocrine tumors sort of on the medical side of things. So these are my disclosures. This is the presentation overview. So I will spend most of the time discussing diagnosis and the uh, therapy. So let's just dive really uh, into this. So neuroendocrine tumors, is this really a problem? Isn't this just a rare uh, disease? Uh, and is there really the need for educating providers and patients uh, about this tumor? And yes, there certainly is. As you can see on this graph, uh, the top uh, blue line is uh, the number of all cancers in the US since 1973. And we can see that things peaked around 1991. And then uh, the number of new cancer cases has been going down. But if you look at the Warren's uh, curve, the report for new cases of neuroendocrine tumors in the US during that same time. And as you can see, uh, the number of new cases has increased steadily over the last several decades. So when you hear hoofbeats, they actually could be zebras. And this is just in southeastern uh, Minnesota as it was out riding and they came up on this uh, zebra. So the uh, zebras are everywhere. So let's get into the diagnostic part of things first. So what's new in pathology, genetics, imaging, and markers? So these are questions I get all the time. So uh, as for the pathology, we do have a classification system new since 2019 that should be used when pathologists look at the new uh, diagnoses of neuroendocrine tumors. And it's very specific and it will influence our treatment choices. But the pathological diagnosis 
often around tumors can be tricky, especially for the grade three well-differentiated tumors, but also for the uh, lower grade tumors. As an example, a study of uh, 175 patients from Europe, this was from several different expert the neuroendocrine neoplasm centers in Europe, and they found that uh, when expert pathologists looked at these tissue samples from outside institutions, uh, they made changes in up to 36% of cases. And uh, these changes led to changes in management in up to a quarter of patients and up to a fifth of cases, there was a new imaging study ordered. So having an expert pathologist look at this is very important. So what about genetics? I get this question too. So uh, we know a lot about the genetics of pancreatic neuron tumors now, but not so much about the other neuron tumors. So the genetics of pancreatic nets can be used to predict recurrences after resection. For example, there are mutations in genes called ATRX and DAX and MEN1. You don't need to remember these, but these are common mutations. And they can predict how things will go after surgery. There is a test not readily available yet called ALT, or alternative lengthening of telomeres, that correlates really strongly with those ATRX and DEX mutations. Simple test to do, and that can also predict outcomes after surgery. So a positive test on a resected tumor will predict a higher risk of recurrence. So hopefully this test will be available uh, soon. So how does that work in practice? So this is a study that just came out this year. So 561 patients with resected pancreatic neuron tumors. And keep in mind, this only applies to pancreatic neuron tumors. And this ALT test was very highly predictive of uh, uh, recurrences. So if you look at all resected uh, pancreatic neuron tumors, and if we move on here and look at the those that tested negative, you see that uh, even 10 years out, they were still doing really well, and only about 20% of them had uh, the cancer come back. If you look at those that were ALT positive, you can see that at the 10 years uh, or 120 months, 80% of these tumors had come back. So just this simple and relatively inexpensive test can predict uh, how likely a tumor is to come back. Well, does this apply to really small tumors that are removed? Yes, it actually does. So you can see those curves are almost entirely the same uh, for the negative patients. There is a low risk of recurrence. For the positive patients, there is a much higher risk of recurrence. So this applies there as well. So what about tumor markers? That's a question I get all the time. Is there anything new in tumor markers? And yes, actually there is. So we know that the conventional tumor markers like chromogranin and others are not reliable and probably shouldn't be used routinely to look for recurrence. But there's a test out there that many of you have heard of called the NET test. It's a sort of like a genetic test where the test, which is a blood test, it looks for molecular evidence of a tumor, a sort of active tumor. And it's a very precise and accurate test and probably one seems to be much more sensitive than uh, any of the other markers. But the question is really when to use it. In this presentation, I will really only focus on one aspect of this test, otherwise I could spend uh, an hour on this, and that's to use it after surgery. So if you look at that uh, bar, the big red bar on uh, the uh, right-hand side here, these are patients, 153 patients, who were all going to have surgery, and they all had a net test before surgery, and all of them had an elevation. See those blue dots there, or these blue streaks above uh, that dotted the black line? So the, this shows that all of these patients had elevated net tests prior to surgery. After surgery, if you look at the left-hand side there, if they had what's called an R0 surgery where all of the tumor was removed, including with negative surgical margins, you can see that the net test dropped substantially in these patients. If you look at the right-hand side there, there are two sets of bars. Uh, and this is looking at the net test pre-surgery or prior to surgery and at post-operative day 30. That's the pod 30 labeled there. So here we have R1 resections where there is a microscopic disease left behind and R2 resections uh, where there is actually obvious disease left behind at the end of the surgery. And as you can see there, the uh, net test does not normalize nearly as much in uh, the patients who actually have residual disease after the surgery is done. 
So now we have shown that the NET test really correlates with the extent of the surgery, but how does this predict recurrence? Let's take a look at the patients who have had a complete resection and take a look at those that have a normal NET test after surgery and those who have an elevated NET test after surgery. So this only follows patients for up to two to three years, but as you can see there, the blue lines at the top, these are the patients with a normal NET test. They don't seem to have a whole lot of recurrent disease. But if you look at the uh, the red lines there, you can see that those are the patients who have elevated NET tests 30 days after surgery. And see how strongly this predicts that the tumors will come back. So here we're uh, seeing that if you have a positive NET test after surgery, there is uh, an overwhelming uh, likelihood of the tumor showing up on scans within two to three years. So I think this is something that we need to be increasingly considering as a test after surgery. Whether this will reduce the number of uh, scans needed, we don't know yet, but it's definitely a test to keep an eye on and an indication to keep an eye on. So let's talk briefly about the somatidin receptor, my favorite receptors. So on the left-hand side, you see a net cell, a neuron tumor cell. And uh, those uh, blue things on the surface are the somatidin receptors. And we can actually stain that with the particular tissue stains called monoclonal antibodies. And this is what that looks like in the microscope. And this uh, stain can help us with diagnosis. It can predict outcomes and is also prognostic in the sense that uh, we can sort of see how patients might do over time, although we don't use it much for that. But we actually use this very, very same receptor to take a picture of neuron tumor cells. So this is what's called the dorotate scan, or sometimes called the gallium scan, which actually is a term we shouldn't really be using anymore because now we have copper 64. So here we have a chemical that binds to the receptors, and to that we can attach a radionuclide, as it's called, either gallium 68 or copper 64. And the tools we need for that, we need the somatidin receptor, we do need a somatidin analog, something that binds to the receptor, we need that the radioactive chemical, either gallium-68 or copper-64, and then we need something that binds this all or glues this all together. And then we inject this in the vein, and this floats around the body, and then it sticks to tumor cells, almost like two pieces of Velcro or two pieces of magnet. So then the rest is sort of flushed off uh, into the, uh, the urine. We take a picture of the entire body, and this is what that looks like. So here we can see a patient who has just had a dorotate pet, and we can see the big red thing there on uh, the right under the diaphragm, that's actually the spleen. And then we can see the kidneys. But if you look at the spine in the middle, you see all of those red dots. These are all tumors in the spine. This is just another way of showing it here. All of these white or light gray dots are actually small tumors in the bones, in the spine, ribs, pelvis, and even some in the liver. So, and these dorotate PET scans can actually show unusual metastases, like this one found the metastasis in the breast uh, in a person with a small bowel neuron tumor. This one found the metastasis in the brain that you can see there. And then we see uh, metastases in the orbits. And as you can see there behind the eyes, even in the heart, these uh, metastases don't necessarily have to cause any symptoms. But what we know with these dorotate PET scans is that we actually find a lot more metastases than we've done uh, before when we had arteria scans or just the CT scans or MRI scans, we're actually finding a lot more disease. So gallium-68 or copper-64, which one should we use? Well, in terms of performance, in terms of accuracy and the sensitivity, they probably are very similar. There are some different chemical characteristics. The copper-64 has a much longer half-life, so you can actually ship that pretty much anywhere in the U.S. So this now opens up the possibility of doing PET scans or dotated PET scans in locations that previously were not able to do that. And that, in turn, can actually cut down on patient travel time and things like that. And make it just much more convenient to, to do. But both isotopes are excellent, and most uh, centers use the PET-CT scanners, but keep in mind that the CT that goes with the PET-CT is not the best CT. So at Mayo and other places, we're increasingly using PET-MRI, where we combine the PET with what's called the, a contrast-enhanced MRI that gives us really good information of the structures in the upper abdomen, like the liver. So what's new in uh, drug therapy? So let's move on to the next chapter here. And um, so always 
consider a clinical trial if you can. So the only way to move the field forward is uh, with the clinical research study. So always consider that if you can. Ask your net provider if a trial is an option for you. So consider that if there's a new diagnosis of a neuronal tumor or if the current therapy is not working. But keep in mind that there are other clinical studies and clinical trials. We have studies that may be looking at lifestyle factors. We have studies that might be looking at quality of life. We have studies looking at psychological and the social aspects of NENS. And there's a lot of research going out there. And if you are asked to participate in a research study, really think about it carefully. Uh, this is, as I said, the, the best way to move this field forward if patients and relatives participate in these studies. So uh, someone said analogs, well, uh, we won't uh, spend much time on this. These are still incredibly important. This is the octreotide and lanreotide. This uh, results in uh, tumor control in many patients, stability sometimes even for many, many years. Two trials I wanted to mention. One is the SPINET trial of lanreotide in lung run tumors. Unfortunately, this trial did not accrue all the patients it it was supposed to accrue, but it did show that the patients who received the lanreotide seemed to do better than those who received placebo. So this may be something uh, to keep in mind. Also, the Clarinet Forte trial uh, looked at the uh, patients who were on, on lanreotide and had progressive disease on standard dose lanreotide and received lanreotide every other week instead of every four weeks. And this trial showed that in, in some of those patients, you could actually control the tumor by several months uh, by doing the lanreotide injections every two weeks instead of every four weeks. So something to keep in mind. What about carcinoid syndrome diarrhea? So when someone comes in complaining about the diarrhea from a neurotic tumor, always ask yourself, is this really carcinoid syndrome diarrhea? Because not all diarrheas are. If it is, then we have telotristed or cermelo that has been shown to reduce the severity of the diarrhea. It's a very safe drug and easy to take and a very valuable tool to manage a carcinoid syndrome diarrhea. PRRT can really help with the diarrhea, but you really have to look for other causes as well. So what's called bile salt uh, malabsorption, which is common in persons who had the pieces of their small bowel removed. And also theatria, which is the inability to digest fat, a very, very common problem in patients who had the pancreatic surgery or in patients on octreotide or lanreotide. So how about PRT? So how does that work? So again, we're back to our neuron tumor cell with some of the seven receptors. And now we have something that binds to the receptor, but instead of having a radioactive chemical that we can take a picture of, we have a radioactive chemical that actually can kill tumor cells. That's lutetium-177 and others are coming. So here's what you need. Again, you need the somatidin receptor. You need something that recognizes the receptor, the somatidin analog. You need a therapeutic radionuclide, in this case, lutetium-177. And again, you need the same glue that keeps this all together. And then you inject this into the vein. It floats around the body. It sticks to the tumor cells and it delivers radiation to the tumor cells that's lethal to the cells. So that's how PRRT works. Right now, we only have lutetium, and but we should hopefully soon get uh, trials of alpha particle therapies, so actinium-225, LED-212, and there might even be some others that I don't know about. So PRRT, is there anything new in PRRT in terms of therapy? Well, it's it's an extremely valuable tool for managing patients with some of uh, receptor positive nets. Well, if you don't have the receptor, it's not going to work. But most patients do have these receptors, mostly studied in grade one and grade two. But there are some studies suggesting efficacy in grade three, and it's very effective to control symptoms. So not only to control tumors, but also to control symptoms. Long-term safety is well established. The secondary leukemia is something that we hear a lot about, but thankfully is pretty uncommon. As for adding other drugs to PRRT, that's still investigational. So there are trials looking at adding chemotherapy and some other drugs to PRRT. So none of those have completed accrual yet. So we'll have to wait to see what those actually show. So here are just a few of the ongoing PRRT trials. There is an alliance trial of PRRT versus Everolimus for lung and nets. There are some other trials there, including the NETR2, which is the first line trial for the higher grade two tumors and the well differentiated in grade three tumors and some other trials to keep in mind. So let's wrap this up by talking about targeted therapy. So the mechanisms of cancer cell growth are very complex. Below there, you see a schematic diagram of cancer cell. You see there's a lot of moving parts there. The way I think about this is like a clockwork. So we have this really complex clockwork, and then you have to throw a wrench in it to make this all stop. 
So for most of those patients with neuronal tumors, it only works for like a limited amount of time. So typically, if you throw a wrench in this, it stops the clockwork for a little bit, but eventually the tumors figure out a way around this. So we have those what's called the kinase inhibitors. Uh, so there's only one approved now, which is sunitinib, and that's limited to pancreatic nets, but others are on the horizon. So this is a field that I think is going to change a lot in the next few years. And I listed just a few of them uh, down there, surfatinib, cabozantinib, lenvatinib, and others. But the one I wanted to mention here is surfatinib. So this is not available in the U.S. yet. So this is an inhibitor of certain uh, sort of COX and that complex machinery of tumor cell growth. So in this study done in China, patients who had neuronal tumors were either given surfatinib or placebo. And uh, these were patients with different types of neuronal tumors, different types of prior therapy for neuronal tumors. But they seem to benefit from uh, this uh, drug in terms of the drug slowing down the tumor growth. And the drug seemed to be pretty well tolerated with no unexpected toxicities. Uh, whether these uh, trials really apply to the patients in the U.S., we don't know, because it seems like the, it was a little different mix of neuronal tumors in terms of uh, primary tumors and prior therapy. But I think this is definitely a drug to keep an eye on. So we have a trial ongoing in the U.S., which I really would like you to consider if possible. So this is a study of another kinase inhibitor called cabozantinib. So this is done because there was a smaller trial in the past that suggested that this actually might work. So now there is a large trial for patients with progressive small bowel, pancreatic, lung, and unknown primary neuron tumors who have been on somatidine analogs and at least one other FDA-approved therapy, typically PRT or Everolimus or Afinitor. And this is the way this trial will work. This is the Alliance Cabinet Study, and patients will be randomized to either placebo or cabozantinib in what's called a 2 2 1 randomization. So, two out of three get the active drug. But those who get placebo, if we find out that they have progressive disease and we find out that they have placebo and they're taking placebo, we can actually cross them over to the cabozantinib if they want to. So where do the kinase inhibitors fit in the therapy of neurontin tumors? Well, uh, for the small bowel nets, we would typically start with a somatic analog and then PRT or Everolimus, and then possibly a kinase inhibitor beyond that. For the pancreatic nets, it's a little bit more complicated. We tend to start with the somatic analogs, and then we have these four good options, PRT, Everolimus, sunitinib, or CAPTEM, or capecitamine and tempotolomide. And then we can sort of cycle through those options. If one doesn't work, we can switch to another one. And then we might actually have those other kinase inhibitors. And if we have a number of them, we could actually recycle them, so to speak, that we would go from one to another and see if we can control the disease that way. So winding down here, and uh, what about immunotherapy? I got this question a lot. So unfortunately, it is disappointing. So immunotherapy has not been very effective, and the, effect, uh, the activity in the common well-differentiated adrenal tumors is minimal. This should not be used outside of clinical trials. In patients with poorly differentiated high-grade neurocrine carcinoma, this actually might work. Probably only in a minority of patients, maybe 10 to 20 percent, but occasionally this works really well. And we're trying to figure out what makes these tumors sensitive to immunotherapy. So I think we'll learn a lot more about who are the patients who actually benefit from this. So that takes me to the end of the presentation. Again, I would like to uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me to speak. And uh, good morning again. Thank you very much, Thor, for this great talk. Now it is my turn to speak to you, and I'll talk to you about uh, what is new for the surgical management of neuroendocrine tumors. So um, when um, like patients do have localized uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, surgery is the only potential curative option. So I think it's uh, very important uh, to remember that. Uh, so surgery has a really important part to play uh, in the management of neuroendocrine tumors. The question, however, is really um, that a lot of neuroendocrine tumor uh, patients present with distant metastatic diseases. You can see here, uh, most of the time, uh, these tumors metastasize to the liver. And so does surgery play a role for those patients as well? And it is not really new information per se, but I do think it's an important piece of information that I would like to highlight over the next few minutes. So uh, liver tumor burden or the amount of tumor that is in one patient's liver, as you can see here on the right side, is uh, really important because the uh, survival uh, usually depends on the amount of liver tumor that is in the liver once 
the tumor has spread to the liver. And therefore, liver failure due to overwhelming liver tumor burden is a really important prognostic factor for patients uh, to be able to live a long time. So we have several options, such as systemic therapies, but also liver-directed therapies, which include surgery uh, for the treatment of uh, liver metastases. And of course, um, as I said before, when you have a localized tumor, you should um, undergo surgery for resection because that is the curative option. But when you have uh, metastatic disease, it really becomes important to go to a specialized center so that the right pathway and the right treatment can be decided uh, depending on several factors. Uh, one of them should be liver tumor burden. So this is a study that I published with Thor uh, not too long ago, uh, where we actually looked at uh, the different systemic treatments for neuroendocrine tumors. As you can see here, that there's very little data telling us how well these things work to control uh, liver metastases. So why is surgery for liver metastasis important and why are we doing more and more of these cases over time? Well, because as I said, surgery is the only potential for cure, although when there is metastatic disease in the liver, we only cure patients very rarely. But there have been uh, retrospective studies that have showed that there is a survival advantage over no surgery. The surgical debulking concept, also known as resetting the time clock, um, is an important concept that is uh, becoming more and more popular. One can achieve major tumor burden removal with surgery, probably more than with uh, systemic therapy. And what's a really important point is that actual complications are much decreased with newer techniques. And surgery can also potentially make systemic therapies work better or vice versa. And I'll talk to you about that for a few minutes. Now, survival after liver resection is pretty good and is usually improved, at least in retrospective studies compared to other therapies. But again, I don't think it should be surgery instead of another therapy. I think it should be surgery in combination with another therapy. This is a study where we looked at patients that had tumors in the bone or what we call like extra hepatic disease. And still those patients, as you can see here in the black curves, benefited in terms of survival compared to those in the blue curves that did not have surgery. So even if there is some disease outside of the abdomen, you may still benefit of surgical debulking. Importantly, liver surgery is safe and has become safer and safer. This is uh, Jim House group and the Waltering group in uh, New Orleans uh, talking about the complications of the surgery. And this is actually new data that is uh, not published yet, but this is our case here as of our first uh, 50 patients. As you can see here, no mortalities, low chance of reoperation by leak and infection. We can do this operation very safely. And I do think that that's a really important factor. When we look at CT or MRI preferentially, at least at the University of Chicago, we try to understand where is the disease? Is it in both lobes of the liver, as you can see here? What is the relationship to inflow and outflow? So the blood that goes in and outside of the liver. And what is the relationship to these major vessels? What is the liver tumor burden? And uh, lastly, how big are these tumors? So we can plan this operation appropriately. And depending on where the tumors are, how big they are, one can be a surgical candidate for uh, liver debulking. This is an example of a patient that had some metastases in the middle of the liver, as you can see here. And we actually used some specific uh, technique called the parenchymal sparing technique. So we actually literally wedge out these tumors one by one um, outside of the liver. Now, the next slide is a little bit more graphic, but I want you to see what it looks like when we actually have removed all these tumors outside of the liver. And you can see here, I pointed all these holes in the liver. We call it the starfish liver or the uh, shark liver because there are many, many places where we have removed these tumors and we can therefore clear vast majority, usually greater than 90 or 95% of the tumor outside of the liver with a combination of either resection or microwave ablation. And this is a resection specimen. This is the MRI of the patient one year post-op, but you can see there has been no tumor recurrence as of there. 
So um, I will talk to you a little bit about current and future technical advances of neuroendocrine tumor surgery, because this is something that is really exciting in our field. As you can probably uh, see, and I'm sure you've heard of, we now do laparoscopic or robotic surgery, meaning minimal invasive surgery uh, for certain uh, neuroendocrine tumor surgeries. The larger incision is often needed when patients have a lot of tumor and a high tumor burden. It means longer hospital stays and uh, laparoscopic or robotic surgery, as you can see here on the right-hand side, means smaller incision, usually less pain, shorter hospital stays. And But there are certain things that we can do laparoscopic and robotic really well, and then certain things that we just need an old-school open operation for. But things are constantly changing, and one of the really big advances in surgery over the last 10 to 15 years has been robotic surgery. Now, uh, that's been used first for gynecologic and prostate malignancies, but now it's used for all kinds of cancers, including uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And as you can see here, the principle is not that the surgeon is um, outside the room, but uses a robot with usually four arms here, as you can see, to actually guide these arms within the abdomen. It allows for 3D vision. It allows also to do certain moves that we could normally not do laparoscopically uh, with the robot. It is thought in studies that robotic surgery is as good oncologically as laparoscopic surgery. There is a little bit of an increased operative time for these procedures, but overall the decreased length of stay is definitely an advantage. So robotic surgery compared to laparoscopic surgery has a similar safety profile, and therefore uh, we think that this is definitely something that is here to stay for neuroendocrine tumor surgery. And again, for certain types of cases, it would be really helpful to use the robot. Now, the new hot thing in robotics is what we call single site robotics. So instead of having multiple incisions, now we're talking about uh, one incision and one port. Now, this is a new platform. It's been used uh, mostly for ENT surgery. As the technology evolves, we can think that uh, in the future, we would be able to potentially do surgeries through a single site platform. So. We use intraoperative ablation for the microwave ablation, so the heating of liver tumors. This is a new advance. It's a 3D navigation ablation of neuroendocrine tumor. So it allows you to exactly calculate and see in real time how much tissue you are ablating. So you're not ablating too much liver tissue or too little liver tissue. This has made microwave ablation a lot easier and faster. And also now we can really easily do it uh, laparoscopically, which we weren't able to do before. And lastly, as a new uh, surgical therapy, NanoKnife has not been very well studied, especially not for neuroendocrine tumors, but it is an interesting concept that may be helpful, especially for unresectable uh, neuroendocrine tumors. As you can see here, the concept is to deliver electricity to the cells, destroy the cell wall, and then have the immune system clean the destroyed cells up. This may be particularly helpful for patients that have unresectable tumors at the root of the mesentery, since this technology does not destroy vasculature and other important structures. Lastly, I'd like to talk to you about systemic therapy and neuroendocrine tumor surgery. There's definitely been improvement in systemic therapies that can help make borderline or inoperable surgical cases into uh, surgical cases. This is an example of a patient with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors who had a lot of diseases. You can see here, he underwent uh, 12 months of, of chemotherapy with Cape Tem and had a lot less disease afterwards, uh, which allowed us to bring him to the operating room. Lastly, PRT may be limited for larger tumors, as the NETA-1 trial sub-analysis showed. But then again, surgery may help PRT work better, as you can see in this data, where the primary tumor was removed and patient lived longer. I do think that it's a little unclear exactly what is going to happen, but we definitely need to continue to study how PRT affects surgery and how surgery uh, affects PRT. So I think there are very exciting times ahead. Um, surgery for NETs and systemic therapy for NETs are greatly improving. Uh, we have to figure out how they work together uh, best. Um, I'm now um, introducing Dr. Um, Ahmed, uh, who is going to talk to you about uh, new therapies for um, interventional radiology.
Thanks, Elise, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Osman or Oz Ahmed. I am an interventional radiologist at the University of Chicago. And uh, today I will be speaking about advances in interventional therapies. So I am an interventional radiologist. I uh, work with uh, a lot of cancer patients. And um, what we do is considered uh, interventional oncology, which is targeting tumors in a minimally invasive fashion, which allows for a quicker recovery time and a shorter length of hospital stay. So among interventional oncology, there are two different types of procedures that include intraarterial and percutaneous procedures. Intraarterial procedures are taking small catheters up to the tumor and injecting a variety of different agents to treat them. Percutaneous ablation is taking a needle from the outside and killing tumor by directly guiding a needle into it. Interventional oncology and neuroendocrine tumor has a lot of interaction, meaning that we do a lot of interventional therapies for patients with neuroendocrine tumor. And specifically, most of our work is done in the liver. And the reason is that the liver is an organ that can be treated with both these intraarterial procedures as well as our percutaneous procedures. Today, we're going to focus mainly on percutaneous ablation because there's been a lot of new exciting updates in that arena. And ablation is a very attractive option because it has very good outcomes. It's aside from it being very minimally invasive, it does have sort of surgical like outcomes of actually removing the tumor surgically. And it can, for that reason, can potentially have a curative effect for some patients. Unfortunately, not all patients are candidates for ablation. And in addition, ablation can be very challenging in certain situations. Those situations include tumors that may be difficult to visualize or those that are near critical structures like blood vessels or other organs like the gallbladder or colon. And in addition, ablation still does require a puncture of the skin. So it is still has an invasive component to it, which risks bleeding or infection. So what are these updates that we're going to talk about? There's been three major advances that we've seen which help us treat patients with cancer. First is methods to improve the visualization of these difficult to see tumors. Second is ways to improve safety of ablation for tumors near critical structures. And the third will be some future horizon therapies that may allow for non-invasive ablation. So what are the ways we can improve visualization of tumors? Specifically, this is a challenge for small tumors because they can be very hard to see sometimes. And so with that follows the logic of if you can't see the tumor, then you obviously can't place a needle accurately within it to treat it. And so we've been working on obtaining new advances in imaging that permit improved visualization to better see the tumor so that we can perform targeted ablation. And that technology for us has been something known as angio-CT. An angio-CT is actually just taking a regular CT scanner and combining that with a traditional X-ray machine. And what that allows us to do is actually allows us under X-ray guidance to put a catheter into the arteries of the liver and inject dye to light it up, after which we can switch over to CT and um, better visualize the tumor. So here's an example of a very small metastatic tumor to the liver, uh, so small that it's very hard to see even on this contrast study that was done as a diagnostic study with a contrast injected through the a peripheral IV. And this is what it looks like to us on the non-contrast scan. It's, again, barely um, perceptible. And again, the red arrow really is a, our best way of seeing where that lesion is. And this makes it very, very challenging to do an ablation. So what we can do, though, now with our angio-CT machine is we can put a, a catheter into the uh, hepatic artery and inject dye to visualize the tumor better. And here you can see even on the angiogram that we can see the tumor. And then when we switch over to CT, the tumor now lights up uh, and it's very easy to see. You don't need the red arrow anymore. And what we can do now is we can continuously inject dye um, and guide the needle perfectly into the tumor. And once that needle is perfectly placed into the tumor, we can burn it away. And this is what it looks like after we have burned it and we've removed the tumor. We can see there's gas in the tumor um, that tells us that the lesion has been treated, and we can inject that dye again from the artery to confirm that. And on the follow-up scan, this patient, you can see it doesn't have any uh, active tumor. And, you know, that brings us to the second point about what about tumors that are near critical stru structures? This is a problem because most of ablation that we do is thermal ablation, and specifically that's microwave ablation, and that's using heat to burn tumors, and that's very effective. However, it has the potential to damage critical nearby structures, such as the bile ducts, gallbladder, nerves, intestine, among other things. And so 
There are newer technologies that are non-thermal that don't utilize heat or cold that might be uh, pr more protective and, and safer to use in these situations. And one of those technologies that we're utilizing now is called irreversible electroporation or, or IRE. And what IRE essentially is, is taking needles and putting it around a tumor and applying a high voltage to it to effectively electrocute the tumor. And what that does is it pokes holes in the membrane of the cell and causes cell death. And the advantage is that IRE doesn't impact all tissues equally. While it's very effective for killing tumors, it actually protects a lot of other structures that have a lot of collagen. And for us, that's a good thing because a lot of structures that have collagen are things we want to protect, like the bile ducts, as well as the blood vessels. And so here's a tumor uh, of a patient in the pelvis. And you can see here on the PET scan, it's easier to see because it lights up bright red there. Um, and that's a tumor that's sitting, unfortunately, right on a big nerve called the sciatic nerve. And it's also right next to the rectum, both of which can be damaged with um, thermal ablation like microwave. So what we do here is we place needles above and below the tumor. And we create the shape of a triangle here for this one. Uh, the red um, circle sort of delineates that the tumor is in between the, the triangle there. And um, you can see here, this is what it actually looks like in real life. The needles are very small, and this doesn't take very long to do. And once we're done, we pull the needles out, and you can see that there's a defect there from the IRE procedure. And so this brings me to my final point of, can we make ablation even safer? And no matter the current technology that we're using for ablation, it requires the placement of needles that need to go through the skin. And there's an emerging technology, however, called hysterotripsy that may actually eliminate the process of actually having to puncture the skin and make the procedure completely non-invasive. And hysterotripsy essentially is uh, like a super ultrasound that targets beams, ultrasound beams at the tumor. And these beams can create small bubbles that lead to cavitation and tumor destruction. And in addition, similar to IRE, because this is non-thermal ablation, it can preserve critical structures that may be nearby. And in addition, it doesn't utilize any radiation. And this is an actual example of a specimen that underwent hysotripsy. And you can see the cavitation. It looks like an asteroid hit this lesion and took out this tumor. Um, what's exciting about hysotripsy is that it's sort of just underway. The first inhuman studies were completed in Europe. And the first trial now has just started in the U.S. And we are one of 10 sites at the University of Chicago that is currently performing hysotripsy and enrolling patients. And so in conclusion, as I mentioned, uh, interventional therapies are non-surgical treatments that we use to minimize collateral damage and target tumors directly. And we use both intra-arterial and percutaneous methods to do that. There have been recent advancements in ablation that really allow us improved methods for visualization, as well as non-thermal treatments that uh, can be used to treat tumors that are close to critical structures, as well as future technologies on the horizon that may make these procedures completely non-invasive. I thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, email me anytime. Thank you, Dr. Koykin and Dr. Ahmed. Now we welcome back Dr. Andy Liao, oncologist and assistant professor of medicine at the University of Chicago, to discuss tailoring treatments to your tumor genetics. Thank you very much. My name is Andy Liao. I'm a medical oncologist from the University of Chicago. Today, I'll be talking about tailoring treatments to your tumor genetics. So we're moving towards an era of precision medicine and personalized medicines. And what that means is that we can use the tumor tissue or the blood sample to determine the genetic code of the tumor via next generation sequencing and other technologies and come up with a molecular report of the tumor's characteristics that can then open opportunities for new treatment options like targeted therapies and immunotherapies and also clinical trial opportunities. So in other words, understanding your tumor's genetic makeup could help us find new treatment options for you. So to understand what this means, I'm going to take you to a quick crash course on cancer genetics. So within a tumor cell, the genetic code is contained in the DNA, and this is packaged into genes. The DNA gets transcribed into RNA, then they get processed and ultimately translated into proteins, which are the key players of the processes within the cells. We use the term genome to describe the entirety of the genetic code of the tumor. And when we say tumor genomics, we mean the tumor's genetic code. So these proteins play into the key processes of the cells, including all these complex regulatory and signaling pathways that can then help the tumor cell grow, survive, make new blood vessels, 
and even become resistant to cancer treatment. So here are some examples of the changes in the genetic code, which we call genomic alterations. So you can have mutations, which is like having a typo in a word. You can have expression, meaning that the gene is always turned on to make the protein. You can have gene amplification, meaning having multiple copies of a gene in the genetic code. You can have gene loss, meaning that um, a gene is deleted from the genetic code. And then you can have fusions and rearrangements in which a part of a gene is fused to a different part of the gene, leading to the downstream pathways to always be turned on. Not all genomic alterations have consequences. There are driver mutations, passenger mutations, actionable alterations have a potentially biological role in the development of the cancer. Variants of unknown significance or VUS alterations unclear risk cancer development. So germline alterations are genetic changes that you're born with, and these can be transmitted to your children. On the other hand, somatic alterations are genetic changes that are acquired during your lifetime, and they only affect the tumors, and they are not passed on to your children. So we use molecular profiling to test for these genomic alterations. So like I said before, we can do these tests from the tumor tissue itself, and we can also do it from the blood, also known as a liquid biopsy, which measures the circulating tumor DNA that the tumor shed into the bloodstream. So this is an example of what a report looks like. As you can see, they show you potentially actionable genomic alterations. They show you both somatic and germline alterations. And they show you other important biomarkers, such as tumor mutation burden, microsatellite instability, that may predict for response to treatments like immunotherapy. So what are the common genomic alterations that we see in neuroendocrine tumors? This is one of the most comprehensive studies in DNA sequencing for neuroendocrine tumors. And the study showed that for high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, these tumors tend to have higher tumor mutation burden, so more mutations per cell. And some common alterations include genes like TP53, KRAS, RB, APC, and MYC. For low-grade neuroendocrine tumors, these cells are generally characterized by lower tumor mutation burden, and common alterations include alterations in genes like MEN1, ATRX, DAX, and etc. And the study showed that about 49% of patients have a potentially actionable alteration. So some examples are high tumor mutation burden, BRCA alterations, FGFR alterations, and HER2 alterations. So if you think about genomic alterations, we really have many different situations drugs of proven benefit that can directly target that genomic alteration. You can also have drugs of theoretical, but yet to be proven benefit. And then you can have drugs of proven non-benefit, meaning the drug has been tested and doesn't work. And finally, you have those alterations for which there are no targeted drugs available yet. So this is an example of a drug of a proven benefit to a given alteration. So this is pembrolizumab, a PD-1 inhibitor immunotherapy treatment for patients whose tumor have a characteristic called microsatellite instability or mismatch repair deficiency. So this is the phase two Kino 158 study. Here is what's called a waterfall plot, which plots the change in the size of the tumor. And so this study included 233 patients, including seven neuroendocrine tumor patients. And overall, pembrolizumab led to a response rate of 34%, with 9.9% of patients getting a complete response and a duration response of greater than four months in 78% of the patients. So a very, very durable response. Caveat is that this is for all comers, and only seven new endocrine tumor patients were included in the study. But nevertheless, this is an FDA-approved treatment for patients whose tumors have MSI high or mismatch repair deficiency, including neuroendocrine tumor patients. Another example of a drug with proven benefit is using pembrolizumab, the same immunotherapy drug, for patients whose tumors have high tumor mutation burden. So this is a different cohort of the same study showing that pembrolizumab treatment for patients with high tumor mutational burden led to an objective response rate of 29%. Uh, notably, the response rate in neuroendocrine tumor patients with high tumor mutation burden was 40%, and the duration of response that lasted for greater than two years um, was seen in 67% of patients. So this, again, is another FDA-approved treatment option for any solid tumor that has a high tumor mutation burden, including neuroendocrine tumor patients. Yet a third example of drugs that have a proven benefit are drugs that target alteration called NTRK, so N-T-R-K, fusions. So this is a drug called entreptinib, 
study in phase one and phase two studies in all solid tumors, and it led to a response rate of 57%, including a complete response rate of 7%, and a median durational response of 10.4 months. And this study included three neuroendocrine tumor patients. So again, this drug was given FDA approval for any solid tumor that has an NTRK fusion, including neuroendocrine tumors. Now we're moving on to talking about drugs that may have a theoretical benefit, but um, the benefit has not yet been proven for neuroendocrine tumor patients. So one example is HER2, which I've definitely seen in my patients. So HER2 can be amplified, and that can lead to cancer growth and survival. And the significant thing is that now there are many, many drugs that can target HER2. These are called HER2-targeted therapies. These treatments have really revolutionized the treatment of many cancers like breast cancer. So for instance, HER2-positive breast cancer used to have the worst prognosis, and now there are so many different HER2-targeted agents. It's really changed the natural history of HER2-positive breast cancer. So what about using these HER2-targeted drugs for neuroendocrine tumor patients whose tumors have a HER2 amplification? Well, we don't know. So that's why I say it's a theoretical benefit, but yet to be proven. But this is prime opportunity to consider a clinical trials. So for instance, if a patient's uh, with a neuroendocrine tumor patient's tumor has a HER2 amplification, then we should really encourage looking for a clinical trial. They can enroll in for one of these HER2 targeted therapies, and many clinical trials will allow patients with neuroendocrine tumors to get on as long as they have the right alteration. Then moving on to the next category, which are um, drugs of proven non-benefit, meaning that the drug was tested against an alteration and it just didn't work. So this is an exa example of pembrolizumab immunotherapy in patients with well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor from the phase two keynote 158 study. And as you can see, overall, the response rate is pretty low, is 3.7% in this population. If you think pembrolizumab targets the PD-1 and pd one axis, so you could imagine that patients with tumors that have pd one expression would respond to pembrolizumab since that's where it targets. But turns out it's not as simple as that. So if you look, patients with pd one expression actually did not respond. So the response rate was 0% to pembrolizumab. On the other hand, there were a few patients who actually responded to pembrolizumab whose tumor did not express pd one which is what pembrolizumab was supposed to target. So this is an example that just because an, a drug can target an alteration doesn't mean that it's always going to work. And finally, we have those genetic, genomic alterations with no targeted drugs available yet. These include some of the most commonly seen alterations in neuroendocrine tumors, such as TP53, RB, MYC, MEN1, DAX, and ATRX. So this really highlights the significant and the need for us to do further research for neuroendocrine tumor patients in terms of both drug discovery and clinical trials. So to summarize, by understanding the tumor's genomics that could potentially open door to additional personalized treatment options, including clinical trial opportunities. This gives new treatment options, new hope to our patients, potentially helping our patients live longer and with better quality of life with neuroendocrine tumors. Understanding tumor genomics may also predict for response to standard therapies and sometimes may give prognostic information for a given patient. We also know that tumors evolve over time and therefore periodically resampling the tumor to reassess the genomics may offer further opportunities to tailor our treatment. And finally, as you've all seen, we really, really need further efforts in research for neuroendocrine tumors in terms of both drug discovery and also in terms of conducting clinical trials to further validate the benefit of some of these off-label targeted therapies. Thank you. From the Pacific Northwest, our next speaker is Dr. Eric Mitra from Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Mitra is a professor of diagnostic radiology and chief of nuclear medicine and molecular imaging. He will talk to us today about future advancements in PRRT. Hi, everyone. My name is Eric Mitra. I'm a nuclear medicine physician at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Today, I'm going to be talking about future advancements in PRRT, or peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. So let's get started. The outline is very straightforward. We'll talk about where we are currently with PRRT so that we're all on the same page, and then we'll see how that translates into future developments with PRRT, and then I'll summarize everything at the end. 
So in terms of where we are currently, PRRT in the United States was FDA approved in January of 2018, and it's indicated for patients with somatostatin receptor positive gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. It's typically used as a second or third line therapy for patients with metastatic disease, which is inoperable, and again, restricted only to patients with GAPNETs, which typically are progressing on uh, somatostatin analogs. In clinically, how we choose patients for PRT is first and very importantly in the context of a multidisciplinary tumor board. That can't be overemphasized how important it is not to make these uh, decisions in isolation or even within a few people. Everyone uh, should really be in agreement that this is the right treatment for you at the uh, right time. More specifically, the, some of the things that we look at are, again, to make sure that the pathology and the subtype and the grade of NETS is uh, appropriate for the indication. The second thing it, that's very important is imaging, both in terms of uh, functional imaging, looking at somatostatin receptors, also sometimes FDG PET, and then, of course, anatomic imaging with either CT or MRI or both. We want to make sure that the labs are appropriate, that there's enough reserve in terms of the bone marrow, kidney function, and a liver function. Although, to be honest, bone marrow is the uh, primary one of interest that we see some toxicity. And then also to take into consideration, of course, the overall picture and what type of symptoms you might be having and other medical conditions that there are. So this is kind of an overview of, of how we currently uh, evaluate patients. The imaging is uh, critical, and there's actually two different uh, isotopes of dotatate that are currently available, either gallium-68 or copper-64. And it's um, universally required to do a pre-therapy PET scan to make sure, as in this case, that there's high expression of somatostatin receptors throughout the vast majority of uh, lesions. What's a little bit more unknown currently, but is being evaluated at many places, is the role of post-PRRT PET imaging using the same dotatate PET scan. I would say that a uh, majority of institutions are doing this, but there's a lot of variability in terms of exactly when this is being done. So this is something that's being looked at uh, more concretely. Another area that falls within that same realm is the role of post-therapy imaging immediately after each cycle of the therapy where we're actually imaging the biodistribution of the therapeutic lutetium-177 dotatate. This is just one example from our institution where we routinely do post-therapy scans and you can actually see an initial response after the first cycle of the therapy and then a slower response after the subsequent cycles. So this is another area that's being investigated at many sites uh, in terms of the role of post-therapy imaging. The uh, therapy itself is given up to four cycles of 200 millicuries of this compound, given approximately every eight weeks apart. That's the standard dosing that's used, and we try to stick to that protocol as much as possible. So with that background said, we can summarize the current PRRT as using lutetium-177 dotatate, given in 200 millicurie doses intravenously up to four cycles, usually as a second line treatment. And now uh, let's look at how this translates to the future of PRRT. So literally every aspect that I just mentioned is something that is being evaluated as something that can be potentially changed and ideally improved for the future of PRRT. So you can see that every single item that I mentioned here is something that is being looked at. In fact, even the indication itself of well-differentiated low-grade or intermediate-grade GEP nets, that too is being looked at very closely in terms of what other areas that can be evaluated. So let's look in more detail at each of these characteristics and just in the sequence that I've shown you here. So the first one is the radioisotope itself. Historically, the first PRRT was actually done with indium-111, which has certainly gone out of favor. And then the more recent compounds that are used are either yttrium-90 or lutetium-177. Again, with lutetium-177, the only one that's FDA approved currently. In the future, the major focus that is being evaluated is the use of alpha particles. 
So alpha particles, uh, some examples are uh, bismuth-213 or actinium-225. There are others as well. And the main difference is that these are much larger particles than the beta minus particles that are currently used. In fact, in terms of the mass size difference, it's about 8,000 times larger. What that translates to is that it's much more effective in causing DNA damage to the cells and is therefore potentially more effective in terms of the therapy. The other side effect to that is that it's also a much shorter range within uh, tissue. It only travels about 0.01 millimeters versus approximately 3 to 8 millimeters for beta particles. So that also translates to lower toxicity as well because you don't bombard the radiation into as much adjacent normal tissue. So the general concept with this is that alpha particles in the future may be able to be used for patients who initially did respond well to beta particles, but then subsequently are no longer responding. And the initial trials that are being done show that it is effective and, again, with low toxicity. So this is a, a major area that's being looked at. The peptide itself is also being evaluated. The current agents that we use are shown on the right side of this figure. Uh, these are somatostatin receptor agonists. So they bind to the somatostatin receptor, activate them, and internalize the radiation into the cell. The newer agents that are being looked at are shown on the left side of the figure, and these are antagonists. And one example of this is uh, LM3. So while these don't actually internalize into the cell, they have higher binding specificity to the receptor and therefore deliver more radiation. And you can see on these comparison images that you can actually see many more lesions in the same patient using the antagonist compared to the agonist. And in the bottom panels, what you can see is that the LM3 is not only useful for imaging attached to gallium-68, but similar to the current dotate compounds, you can actually also attach it to lutetium-177 and therefore deliver higher radiation dose for the therapy as well. So this is certainly something that potentially incrementally advance the field. The dose itself mentioned is currently fixed at approximately 200 millicuries every four cycles. And the only real deviation that we make to that is if the patient does have some toxicity, again, usually to the bone marrow, then we can, for one cycle, reduce the dose in half to 100 millicuries to allow the body more time to respond. In the future, there's many different ways that this can be changed. The biggest one is to do personalized dosing based on dosimetry. So the way this is classically done is, is using post-therapy dosimetries. So the first 200 millicuries is given as a standard, but then uh, personalized dosimetry is done to see how to change that either up or down for the subsequent cycles. You could potentially even do this before even the first cycle by giving a very small amount of lutetium-177 or using the newer agent copper-64, which has a longer half-life. The problem with personalized dosimetry is that the protocols are, are very unclear and they are very difficult to do for most institutions. And perhaps the biggest thing is that the outcomes are not quite clear. So this is, again, something that is being evaluated in clinical trials. The other way that a few institutions have looked at this is to do an induction with perhaps a slightly lower dose of dotatate with 150 millicuries instead of 200 millicuries up front, but then to continue maintenance therapy with approximately 100 millicuries or a lower dose up to many, many cycles every six months. So this is a completely different approach than what's being done now, but they are finding some uh, promising results. The root of administration is currently intravenous, but there are several sites that have looked at the role of intraarterial PRRT. This is using the hepatic artery to deliver the radiation directly to the uh, liver for patients who have primarily or only uh, liver metastasis. So the theory of it makes a lot of sense because you could potentially avoid systemic radiation to the body. But what you can see in the images from this more recent study that was done at UCSF is that depending on the patient and their distribution of disease, the IV versus the interarterial administration results in sometimes increased uptake, but sometimes decreased uptake. So this particular uh, aspect of research, I think, requires a lot more investigation before it can um, really be utilized because there's some mixed results so far. The number of cycles is essentially a variation of the number uh, of the actual dose that was mentioned previously. Again, we're currently limited to a maximum of four cycles. One of the big things that gets asked uh, many times is, 
if the patient initially responded very well to PRRT and had a good progression-free response, then why not just repeat the entire treatment cycle uh, up to four cycles or maybe slightly less, and that's called repeat or salvage PRRT. This has been looked at again in, in a number of clinical trials showing good response, but this is, needs further evaluation before it's being done. We're just getting at the in the United States to the point where we're starting to do this potentially clinically, but we don't know yet if insurance will routinely approve repeat PRRT or not. The other way to think about it is in terms of cumulative dose. Again, this is just a variation of the individualized dose that was mentioned previously in terms of personalized dosimetry, but you can also think about it not just per cycle, but also overall some patients may not entirely need the four cycles. Some patients may need additional cycles as well. And we talked about the, uh, this idea of induction followed by maintenance therapy as a variation of this. Uh, sequencing and combination therapies is probably one of the biggest areas that's being looked at. Currently, we're using it only by itself or maybe in conjunction with somatostatin analogs. But there are a lot of studies that are being done to look at combination therapies for instance, capecitabine is a radio sensitizer, so that in combination with PRRT might be more effective. PARP inhibitors cause DNA damage, which is also what PRRT does. So again, that uh, is something that could be more effective. And then sequencing, currently it's being done as second or third line, but there are studies that are looking at doing it as first line or even as a neoadjuvant therapy prior to initial surgery to reduce the amount of tumor burden and therefore make the surgery more effective. And lastly, the indication itself is also being looked at in terms of differences in the type of grades or the type of tumor, such as looking at outside GEP nets, such as lung tumors or unknown primaries, pheochromocytoma, paraganglioma are examples. There's a large trial called the NETR2, which is looking at increasing the grade of tumor Instead of just lower intermediate, they're also looking at well-differentiated grade three tumors as well. Just a quick example of a patient selection for patients with FIO and PARO, which goes at the current indications. And you can see here two different patients who have very different imaging characteristics on MIBG, which is the FDA approved therapy for FIO and PARO versus um, dotatate. And you can see the patient one may benefit from either therapy, whereas patient two uh, according to the imaging, really would only benefit from the dotatate therapy. So just an example, how we can use imaging to guide the appropriate type of therapy. And these kinds of things are what is being looked at for use. So uh, in summary, the current FDA-approved indication for PRRT is just to start. And literally all different aspects of that current regimen are being evaluated in terms of improving the outcomes for patients for this already effective therapy. So. With that, I will conclude and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. We hope you enjoy our next conference presentation, a panel discussion about net treatment sequencing, a topic that you told us you were very interested in. It is moderated by conference co-chair, Dr. Xavier Koitkin, with this morning's speakers, Drs. Liao, Ahmed, Hafdonerson, and Mitra. Welcome again to our treatment sequencing panel. Today we have an extraordinary team of uh, clinicians and uh, net specialists. Um, I'm Xavier Koitgen. Um, I'm a surgeon uh, at the University of Chicago. And uh, we have uh, Thor Hafdanison, uh, who is a net um, oncologist at Mayo Clinic. Uh, we have um, Eric Mitra, who is a nuclear medicine physician at uh, OHSU. And then we have our own Oz um, Ahmed, who is an interventional radiologist um, at the University of Chicago. And last but not least, um, Andy Liao, who is our neuroendocrine tumor um, oncologist at the University of Chicago. Welcome to all of you. I'm really excited to have you here. So um, this is going to be a, a treatment sequencing panel that uh, is essentially based on uh, two cases in a tumor board style format. So I'm going to go right ahead and let's get this going. So. I know we all come from different institutions and we all have a different decision process, but this is how we do it at the University of Chicago, just to briefly summarize for our patients, when a neuroendocrine tumor is resectable and it's not metastasized, we try to resect them uh, and then we follow those patients. But what we're going to talk about today is mostly those tumors that are not uh, uh, localized and that have uh, distant metastases 
And there are several options, as you can see here. We will discuss um, all of these options um, if they come up throughout the treatment. So let's go ahead and let's start and jump into the first case. So case one is a 55-year-old male who presented to our clinic with flushing, diarrhea, and uh, low extremity uh, swelling. I'm going to tell you uh, that uh, he had a urinary 5-HIA, which was very high, and a chromogranin A, which was very high as well. He had a CT scan, which showed, as you can see here, uh, with the, where the blue arrow is, uh, a big mass in the left lobe of the liver. So this obviously suggestive of a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor. He had a biopsy of the liver, uh, which uh, showed a well-differentiated grade 1 neuroendocrine tumor with a KI67 of less than 3%. So why don't we start with Thor? Um, what would you recommend uh, the patient has done next? Uh, is there anything in particular, especially with the symptoms that you could read here that makes you suspicious or that you would want to uh, work up further? Absolutely. So we have uh, obviously a very strong uh, clinical evidence for uh, active carcinoid syndrome. So we have someone with flushing and diarrhea and with very, very high 5-HIAA. So this tumor is really making a lot of serotonin. So with the lower extremity swelling, before we do really anything to this liver, I would really want an echocardiogram just to see if uh, the cardiac valves uh, are affected by the uh, the sort of chronically elevated the serotonin. So that is probably what I would start by doing right now. Fantastic. Believe it or not, we had the same idea. So he did get a TTE actually, which later turned out to be a TE as well. But essentially what that showed was a dilated tricuspid analyst with severe reflux. What that actually means in layman's term is that he had like carcinoid disease of his valve. And so his valve uh, was not competent, which could explain why he had some low extremity swelling. Andy, what would you do in this uh, situation? Well, I think this patient needs, you know, medical treatment, so systemic therapy for both for the carcinoid syndrome, but also for the tumor itself, you know, to slow down the growth of the tumor. And generally we consider some out of stand analogs like Lemriotide or Octreotide OAR in this situation. Great. Would you send him to a cardiologist with this um, echocardiography finding or? Um... So we definitely need to get our cardiologists involved, especially if we're thinking about other treatment options for the patients for the future, such as surgery. Okay, so this is exactly what we did. Like Andy said, we started him on a long-acting octreotide, and he actually saw the cardiologist who sent him to the cardiac surgeons who thought that it was necessary to fix his valve. So he did undergo a successful valve replacement therapy with cardiac surgery. So what do we do now? Let's go back to uh, Thor. What would you do now? You have a patient that's on long-acting octreotide, this cardiac valve is fixed. Low extremity swelling is gone. Anything in particular that you would want to address? Yes, right now, I think I would want to know the extent of this uh, disease. And then now I'm thinking in terms of regional therapy, be it the resection or the embolization or some liver tracted therapy. So if we haven't done it already, I would do a GA68 total tape, PET CT, or a PET MRI. And uh, just to get a little better idea about the extent of uh, this malignancy. And also, I would inquire about any intermittent symptoms of bowel obstruction, anything to suggest that the primary tumor might be causing problems. Okay, great. Oz, when you've seen this large mass in the liver, is that something that you could consider for interventional radiology treatment? And if yes, what would you use? Yeah, absolutely. It's fairly large, as you can see on the CT. Um, uh, exam there, you know, and, and so from an interventional approach, we, we have sort of two main options. One is percutaneous ablation, which is, you know, taking a needle and, and either burning or freezing the tumor um, or interarterial uh, therapy. Uh, for a lesion this large, if we were sort of asked to intervene on this, I would uh, side with interarterial therapy because of how large this is. It would probably not be really, you know, effectively treated with ablation because of its size. And, you know, among the interarterial therapies, you know, the options would include radioembolization or uh, bland embolization, those would be probably the two uh, main sort of treatment choices. Great. So he did have an outside dotate PET CT, but it showed that there were minimal bone disease and that most of his disease was actually limited to the abdomen. So he had one large liver lesion that lit up as well as two smaller lesion in the right lobe. And then he had this mesenteric mass as well as the primary, which uh, lit up in the mid small bowel. So what we did is we actually took him to the operating room. 
mostly because he also kept to be continuously symptomatic despite being on somatostatin. But we felt that most of his tumor burden being in the abdomen and because he was a young patient with a good heart, we felt that he was actually a good operative candidate. So we took him to the operating room. He underwent surgical resection of a small bowel a neuroendocrine tumor and uh, he underwent a left hepatectomy and we ablated two lesions uh, on the right side. So in the meantime, we saw a really steep drop in his serotonin levels. He became asymptomatic. And what do we do now? Andy, in a patient that's asymptomatic after you have debulked him, would you actually consider continuing long-acting octreotide or would you stop it at this point? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I guess it depends on how much the surgeon was able to take out, so how much disease is left behind. So if there's still a lot of disease left behind, and maybe if they're kind of still minimally symptomatic, then I probably would favor continuing SSA. If the majority of disease is resected and asymptomatic, then one option would be just to stop it and to observe. So, Thor, any ways you particularly do it at the, at the Mayo Clinic? I guess uh, I agree with uh, Andy that I would be inclined to continue. I guess you could make an argument if there's only low volume asymptomatic bone disease, if a person wanted to get the little trial off uh, study, but for most of these, I would continue them on uh, somerset analogs. Okay. All right. So we continued with MRIs uh, mostly, and the, uh, this is an MRI one year after surgery. As you could see, there was no residual disease in his abdomen that we could at least tell. Now, of course, this is a like interesting case. We actually opted not to continue octreotide, also mostly because of patient preference. He felt really good. He didn't really thought that he needed it. But I do agree with Thor and with Andy as well. If you have extra hepatic disease, you could certainly consider it, uh, especially if it's bone disease. But he was asymptomatic from his bone disease as well. Now, about two years after all of this started, he had a parotid tumor resection because he developed something in his parotid, a mass that was biopsied and thought to be some questionable malignant like parotid lesion, but there wasn't really a good diagnosis on the final aspiration. And lo and behold, now this comes back on final histopathology after the surgery has been performed as a metastatic well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor grade 2 with a KI67 of 5%. So what do we do now? Well, I'll let um, Eric actually jump in here as a nuclear medicine uh, physician. This would be probably a good idea to get a dotated PET CT. Would you agree on this patient in this case? Like you're biased with surgery, so I'm obviously biased with... Uh... PET scan. So yeah, I would, I would definitely agree that, you know, um, and also I agree with Thor right in the beginning that that's something we would typically do right up front. And the other thing I just wanted to point out for everyone who's listening is that it, the Dota tape PET scan can be done with Gallium 68, as Thor said, but also with uh, Copper 64, which is now available in a lot of institutions as well. And it's, and I also advocate for the PET MR, which he mentioned as well, but at this point, definitely worth restaging. So how would you assess what I just showed you here? very extensive metastasis pretty much you know throughout the skeleton it looks like and then the, also i believe some lymph nodes that are probably within the abdomen upper abdomen and maybe in the chest so very extensive metastasis so let's remember he was not on octreotide for that period you could argue it's been progression of disease of therapy right because the patient except for surgery which is a localized treatment has not had any real systemic therapy so what would you do next? Um, Eric, would you think that he's a good candidate for PRT up front? Or Thor and Andy, would you guys consider putting him back on octreotide first? Yeah, we definitely want to be very careful in terms of using PRT because it is a very effective therapy, but something that you don't want to necessarily jump to. So I think at our institution, we would, number one, re-image with a CT or MR. Well, you're right that the, the Dota tape pet probably clearly shows progression. It would be also important to kind of validate that with some other imaging as well. And I think we would probably restart SSAs first and, and see how that goes before before moving on to PR. Thor, would you agree with that? Yep, I would absolutely agree with that. I would uh, restart a somatostatin analog therapy, but it would be nice to have some sort of more anatomic cross-sectional imaging. Although with this amount of bone disease, I think we'll end up having to rely on the PEPT quite a bit. Right. Andy, any yeah, I think, you know, having a few, a few different time points of imaging to get us a better sense of the pace of disease, that's also important. And also seeing, you know, how his symptoms, especially the carcinoid syndrome symptoms, 
have changed also gives us, you know, a sense as well. But assuming he's clinically stable, then I agree with resuming the SSA and maybe with short-term re-imaging. Great. The patient's symptoms returned during this time or no? No, there was the interesting part. He, he actually, and his serotonin levels still stayed quite low. So it, it was actually mostly incidentally discovered really at that point. And to your point of anatomical, so he did get MRIs every three months and we did not notice this enlarged like lymphadenopathy on the MRI. At least it didn't seem to be significantly different than what it was before. Okay, so 12 months after that Dodate PET CT, so obviously had like anatomical scanning every three months after we started monoptotide, but again, not much significant difference, but we did repeat a PET scan 12 months later, and this was the previous scan. This is the new scan. So how would you interpret that? Yeah, this is again, showing progression of the widespread metastasis that was seen before. This is a good example where, you know, even on PET, you can definitely tell that there's progression. Okay, so Oz, I have a question for you from an interventional radiology perspective. When you have bone disease like this, is there like anything you can offer these patients? Yeah, that's a great question. As you know, while you were loading that image and Eric was sort of talking about the progression, I was sort of looking at some of the areas that may be amenable to um, some of our therapies. Specific patients like this who have sort of extensive disease may not be ideal surgical candidates, especially when there's metastatic lesions to weight-bearing areas of the body, uh, like the acetabulum or the hip, essentially a common area where patients may develop metastatic disease. And it looks like this patient is starting to develop that. There are some very cool, innovative things we can do now where we can do what I mentioned with percutaneous ablation, where we can either burn or freeze the tumor away, but then we can follow that with by reinforcing that area with cement. Um, so we call that cementoplasty with ablation. And we're now actually also moving towards placing screws using image guidance and minimally invasive. So um, avoids kind of a, a large operation for these patients who would probably not be ideal surgical candidates. Great. Thank you, Oz. Obviously, in this case, he was asymptomatic from a bone disease. But I do think that your point is exceptionally well taken, especially for patients that actually do have symptomatic disease, especially if it's localized disease and if there's some significant weakening of the bone in that area, right? So in this case, we opted to move on to systemic therapy. What type of systemic therapies do we have available, Andy? And what would you recommend for, for uh, this type of patient? So PRT uh, with lutetium dolite is definitely... Uh, FDA approved standard treatment. There's also um, Everlimus is another treatment. There's no head to head comparison. We kind of have to, you know, kind of assess patient characteristics and everything and, and think about ultimate goals. Given the favorable, um, you know, benefit to toxicity profile PRT, usually this is a situation where I would recommend doing that. Thor, any difference in opinion at Mayo? I would, uh, I completely agree with Andy. I think this is the time you have to sit down with the patient and talk about the two different treatments that are approved. Uh, keep in mind though, that if, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, FDA has not approved Everolimus for uh, small bowel nets with carcinoid syndrome based on radium 2, uh, which was a trial that barely missed uh, sort of its target of being significant. But that said, I think it's still a reasonable choice. I would say a PRT is, is, I think, a much more effective uh, treatment for this disease than ever is. Um, Eric, do we need to be worried about PRT uh, when there's that much bone disease? What's, is, has there been any data? Do patients need to be worried if most of the disease is in the bone that they will actually have a higher rate of problems with the bone marrow or a higher rate of radiation to the bone marrow and have a higher risk of developing bone marrow toxicity and maybe even malignancy? Yeah, it's a really good question that I think, you know, everyone should kind of discuss with their treating physicians, but it's a little bit of a dichotomy. It's interesting that the main thing that we worry about with Ludothera actually is bone marrow toxicity, primarily platelets uh, decreasing, but sometimes um, some of the other cell lines as well. Having said that, the uh, distribution of the disease in the bones doesn't seem to be a predictor for having that type of toxicity. In fact, there's been several studies where those patients with very extensive bone disease didn't have any correlation with worsening hematologic toxicity, and those and some patients that didn't are the ones that actually did. So we don't rely on that in terms of deciding whether or not to uh, be concerned about that, but it is something that we follow very carefully for all patients. The other thing that I would just point out, at least again in our institution, is that we tend to be very careful in terms of treating only bone disease because that doesn't tend to you know, ultimately 
kill the patient. Um, and it and if the patient in this case, as you're saying, is still asymptomatic, it's a odd distribution of disease. I can't tell entirely from these from these MIP images, um, but it doesn't look like any significant liver disease and maybe some nodal Correct. disease. So we would be kind of very thoughtful about whether or not this is the the right moment. And in fact, maybe some of the more directed therapies that Oz was talking about or also um, done by uh, radiation oncology, those approaches might also be something to consider, at least to buy some time until you start PRRT. Very good point. So he's had two cycles so far, and our repeat scanning things looked stable. So that's for him right now. So uh, we're going to jump to the next case. So this is a 62-year-old male who presents with a newly diagnosed pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. It's a grade 2, CAS 67 and it's a stage 4 tumor. The imaging always makes me a little bit not happy when radiologists comment on innumerable bilobal liver metastases. I always say, well, they don't spend the time to, to you know, count the lesions. But this is a MRI that shows indeed that there's quite a bit of disease, as you can see here. So let's say the patient has between 50 and 100 lesions in his liver. And then he does have about a two and a half centimeter lesion in the pancreatic tail. It's, uh, he's completely asymptomatic. This was discovered um, incidentally. So he has no symptoms. Um, Andy, what would you do for this patient? Well, it seems like, you know, the patient should be considered for systemic therapy. And with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, typically we choose a somatostatin analog like octreotide LAR or lenriotide as first line therapy. But sometimes with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, sometimes we think of um, the ultimate goal of the patient too in centers with surgical expertise, especially with the intent of if we're trying to get them to downstage to become a surgical candidate, then sometimes we may be a little more aggressive. But curious to see what other people think. Thor, what would you start this patient on? Yeah, so I guess you could make an argument for careful observation with health therapy, but this is a they, it's a grade two, K67 is 7%. Some of those lesions may even have a little bit of like necrotic center to them. So I, I, I'm not sure that this one will necessarily play nice. So, uh, so I would, if the patient really strongly wanted to, to uh, try without therapy, I'd be okay. And they would scan in two to three months. Uh, if there were symptoms present uh, of tumor bulk, I would consider capecitabine and temozolomide. I would not consider upfront PRRT unless that was done on a clinical trial. And then we have, uh, obviously, if this lights up on uh, dobotate imaging, we have octreotide or lanreotide, and then obviously everolimus and sunectinib, which I favor later. I would say either uh, a somatostatin analog or uh, capecitabine and temozolomide based on symptoms. Great. So he was started on somatostatin analogs and asked to return in three months for surveillance imaging. And the repeat MRI was interesting because it shows that overall the liver lesions were stable, although maybe a few were mildly enlarged, but the primary tumor started growing. So the primary tumor went from 2.4 times 2.1 to 2.9 times 2.4 centimeter. So is this something we need to be concerned about? So interestingly, we see this occasionally, and in the absence of symptoms, in the absence of bile duct obstruction, I might possibly just sit tight and scan again in a few months. Uh, and if this continues, everything is stable in the liver, but the primary tumor in the, uh, in the pancreas is just progressing, I would actually call up the radiation oncologists and see if they could possibly do radiation to this. I've done that occasionally. Okay. Um, Oz, when you look back at this liver here, I'm going to put this back to you one more time. Is this something that you can address with interventional radiology treatment, assuming that, of course, there's no widespread disease, that there's truly just a disease in the tail of the pancreas and in the liver? And if yes, what would you use? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, the report says innumerable uh, liver metastases. However, if that's really the only site of disease outside of the, the primary lesion, this would be sort of an ideal candidate for, you know, some of our some of our therapies. You know, as we mentioned, it's local regional, meaning we can target the liver specifically and as long as the liver function is okay, meaning that the normal liver is still functioning fine, which even with these number of lesions, it usually is, we can treat all these lesions. And usually that's through an intra-arterial uh, method, meaning we'll take uh, a catheter and go into the arteries of the liver and treat from inside. And these lesions are all hypervascular, meaning they suck up you know, anything we, we inject from the arteries. So I would choose for a tumor like this with this many lesions and this hypervascular uh, bland embolization where we would treat the right lobe and then followed that with the left lobe about four to six weeks later. And so it essentially be two procedures separated in time by four to six weeks. Thank you, Oz. So 
we actually opted to start him on Cape Tam. The reason why we did this is because we thought that there was some mild progression on Octreotide, and we thought that even though, as Thor said, it's very reasonable to sit tight, I think, and to just wait another three months, we thought that the inevitable was probably around the corner and that in the next three or six months it would progress further. So we continued SSA and started him on Cape Tam, which is a form of oral chemotherapy that is usually pretty well tolerated by most patients. Now, he started responding. So we scan our patients every three months while they're on chemotherapy. And as a matter of fact, his MRI a year later showed that there were very few lesions left. So he had a pretty drastic and amazing response to Cape Tam. You know, here's an example of where you could see multiple lesions now. Suddenly there are only two lesions left. So is this something, Andy, that you see often when patients have these type of tumors? Uh, and you start on, on uh, like Cape Tam, are these the type of responses that you see often, or is this uh, uh, once in a blue moon? So we definitely have seen this type of response. If you go by the data, you know, if you look at a trial or pancreatic neurodivy tumor, the ECOV trial, about one in three patients will have an objective response, meaning, you know, major tumor shrinkage. But in our experience, we have seen dramatic responses like this. And that's why, you know, sometimes we kind of have to think longer term, what are we trying to achieve here? You know, are we going to make this patient become a surgical candidate for um, liver debulking like um, Dr. Koiken does? And if so, then it may be worthwhile to give it a try and see if we can downstage him like this. So, Eric, what do you take of this? What will you do now? Just like the last case, I think with that type of distribution of disease, it would be a great idea to get a Dota tape scan in the beginning to, to make sure that we're just seeing what we're seeing on the MRI is the extent of the disease and there's nothing beyond that. And then also the um, quality of the MRI is also important in terms of using hepatocyte specific contrast agents, especially when we were talking about kind of different small differences in size, uh, you know, something like that would, would also be helpful. So the bottom line is kind of high quality imaging can help guide, you know, the therapy. And I think when you talk about MRIs, we tend to use our scans with EOVIS, which is, you know, a specific dye for the palatability phase. And we quite often can detect more lesions on those scans than we can on a regular MRI with, you know, like GATAVIS or even on a triple phase CT scan. So I do think that you make a really, really good point that like ultimately you can only see what shows. Um, and so you have to be aware that, that there are specific scans that you may want to use in specific situations to look at specific things. Very good point. But if, in fact, the uh, PET scan is showing no additional disease and the, and the liver tumors are shrinking based on this therapy, what's the pancreatic till mass? Did that change at all or no? It did. Yeah, it went down to about 1.8 centimeter from yeah. 2.9. So I think that's a you know, really good response. And I agree with your comment also that uh, potentially, at least in our institution with Dr. Pommier, we would definitely probably consider some surgical approaches there as well. What about you, Thor? What would you do in this situation in at uh, Mayo? So this is uh, probably what they have found sometimes called like an exceptional responder. And this, the, the, this uh, term I think comes from Memorial. About half of these will actually continue to have a response uh, even beyond 12 months if uh, the treatment is stopped and you don't really fully understand uh, why. But here I think as was hinted at by Eric is that it, now the question is, do you believe that resecting the primary tumor will alter the eventual outcome. Essentially, will the patient live longer if you go after the primary tumor? And as you well know, pancreatic surgery is not a small deal. I would actually run this by my surgeons now. Okay. Now, this is what we did. And the surgeons in this case, which was me, uh, <laughs> but of course with Andy's uh, blessing, um, at tumor board and Oz blessing too. So we decided to go to the operating room. We did a distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy. Actually didn't find that many liver lesions, about 15. So you can always usually find more in the operating room that you actually see on the scans. So we ablated six and we resected nine. We also did a cholecystectomy since we did anticipate that he may go on octreotide long-term. Now, interestingly, you know, the preoperative pathology showed it was a grade two, the postoperative pathology, and this is both the liver and the primary tumor, showed a grade one tumor. So, you know, can you comment on that, Andy? Is there heterogeneity in these tumors when we biopsy them or even when the pathologist looks at them? Or is it the chemo that downstaged uh, or, or downgraded these tumors? What do you think? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, these tumors are heterogeneous and sometimes it just depends on where you biopsy. You may get two slightly different grades or, you know, tumors also evolve over time, you know, through chemo, through different treatments. And sometimes biology may change and their pace may change too. So 
So it's definitely very interesting. And we have seen, you know, discordance between somatostatin receptor expression as well between like primary tumor sites and static sites and et cetera. So. Great. Now, what now? Should we start him on uh, like SSA post-op? Remember, he was on SSA pre-op, had some progression at least of his primary tumor. Is it worth continuing SSA store or should we just wait and see? Or what would you do? I would probably not do anything for three to four months. And then I would love to see a Dorothy PET MRI with a hepatobiliary contrast. And uh, I probably wouldn't do anything until it starts moving again. Okay. And this is what we did. We did nothing. We scan him every three months, of course. And a year later, everything looks pretty good. So now we know that this patient will probably recur, right? Because we know that once the cat's out of the bag and the tumor has metastasized to the liver, as a surgeon, I can't cure him. Oz usually can't cure those patients either with this liver-directed therapy. Now the primary is out. The biology seems to be favorable, at least like on the pathology from the surgery with a low-grade tumor. But th this patient will recur at some point. And if the patient does recur, Eric, would you think that because he didn't really respond well or didn't have stable disease really on octreotide, you would move right up to PRT? Or would this something be dependent on where he recurs? If it's in the liver, maybe liver-directed therapy. If it's outside um, of the liver, then maybe something more systemic. How would you address this? Yeah, so basically the you know eligibility for PRT depends primarily on imaging to show that there's high somatostatin expression homogeneously across you know all the sites of the disease. But then secondly, definitely on the distribution of the disease as well, as well. If it is again primarily within the liver, we would typically at our institution consider liver directed therapies that Oz does first. Um, and if that doesn't provide enough control, or if there's extensive disease outside of the liver, then Yes, we would probably move to PRRT. I don't think there's probably a role for retrying SSAs because he, he progressed on that previously, but I don't think it would be wrong either, at least for a for a short time with imaging to see how, how stable you can make it. Andy, do you have any comments about this? I think it just depends on the you know the pattern recurrence, localized versus widespread systemic, but also you know the pace of the disease if Suddenly, if we see that the uh, disease explodes, then you may want to consider actually re-biopsying and see what's different about it, you know. What do you mean by that? Sometimes we have seen that, you know, tumors change in biology. We have seen patients with well-differentiated tumors for different treatments. Um, suddenly, their cancer starts to behave more aggressively. And when we did a biopsy, we find out that actually there was a clone of much higher grade disease. We have seen patients who have, for instance, originally a grade one or grade two tumor, and when you re-biopsy, the KLC7 is like 60% or they become fully differentiated. And as those would be more appropriate to consider cytotoxic chemotherapy. You know, we always correlate the PET scan, Dota tape PET scans with the anatomic imaging that we see. And I mentioned that everything needs to be heterogeneous on that scan. If we see certain areas that don't show high uptake, on the on the scan or differences, then that's especially kind of indicative of what Andy is saying, and we would specifically go and biopsy those areas that show differences and not high uptake, because they may have gone to a higher grade. Very good point. Thor, would you agree with the statement that it's important for patients to understand that th there are a fine amount of therapies, that these therapies generally tend to work well? But that, like you said yourself, sometimes we just sit tight and wait because there's no rush of trying to use these therapies in a rapid sequence unless we absolutely have to, right? Is this something that, uh, do you see it the same way to try to use the right therapy at the right time? And sometimes we take breaks and we just watch. Oh, I, absolutely. I don't think there, we have the data to suggest that, uh, that continuous therapy necessarily leads to a prolonged survival or longer life expectancy. I completely agree with Andy. I would have a low threshold for biopsy. Sometimes even a biopsy could make a patient eligible for a clinical trial. Some there are PRT trials now looking at patients with KC7 more than 10%. And we could uh, consider in the unlikely event we found an actionable alteration, we could consider a trial for that. But the good thing here is actually we have a number of reasonably effective options. And uh, I don't think, right. and I think this case beautifully illustrates the constant headache we all have regarding sequencing therapy for metastatic pancreatic mets. There is no right answer, typically. Right, because I would completely agree, and this is about sequencing, right? I mean, we could have 
just branched off in a completely different pathway by just saying, well, you know, the, the hepatic lesions, which is probably the most important prognostic factor for this patient, you know, did not significantly change after the lanreotide therapy here. Um, but the primary tumor grew a little bit, right? So we could have just, like you said, continued octreotide, and we could have maybe give external beam radiation to the primary, or maybe just watch it for another three months or another six months. And then maybe if he would have progressed, we would have just gone to PRT. I think that would have been a reasonable therapy as well. I don't think anybody would say that it's not like appropriate to start PRT if you have progressed on long-acting octreotide. Not everybody needs to go through Cape Tem up front, right? So I think, and they're always concerned also that if you plan to give PRT, right, and somebody has been on Cape Tem, that their bone marrow can take a little bit of a hit while on Cape Tem, we see that sometimes. And then you have to delay PRT. So I think these are all decisions that we all do in our daily basis and that are maybe very different for one patient and may also change for another patient. It really depends on a lot of things. Some patients are not interested in surgery. Some people really want surgery. And then we know that we're trying to you know, downstage them as quickly as we can to you know, get them to surgery. I think these are really important questions that we brought up today by showing that this treatment sequencing arch here is, is, is really something that, that is not just institutionally dependent, but also dependent on like the patient, the tumor type, how is the patient doing um, how's the tumor, right? What biology is the tumor, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think this was really important um, like for our patients to um, understand how we discuss these patients um, at tumor board. And I'll ask maybe each one of you to just give a final word because I've talked way too much. Um, Thor, is there anything you want to add? No, I would just uh, emphasize the, uh, the importance of tumor board. So I do this for a living and every week I have to phone a friend because there is a situation where I'm not sure if I necessarily have the best uh, uh, plan. So uh, just uh, make sure that uh, yeah, don't let your ego get in the way. So this is a team uh, approach. Um, Eric, I, any, any comment? I completely agree. I completely agree with that comment. I mean, I think these were great cases to show just how complicated you know, things can be, and there aren't clear answers in terms of sequencing. So just as Thor said, so important to, you know, work together with all your colleagues from all the different specialties and get everyone's input. And that's really the best way to do it. Oz? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and reiterate that. Um, I think in this, from this tumor board, um, I think we've demonstrated that your options are highly variable. They can range anything from just careful surveillance all the way up to surgery. So I think making decisions in a vacuum or a bubble, you know, without the input of other is highly discouraged because it's really important to sort of get multidisciplinary input. And I think a lot of our treatments specifically in interventional may impact potential future surgery and, and things like that. So it's very important that everybody sort of makes these decisions together. And finally, Andy. Yeah. And going on that, you know, if you don't have access to a multidisciplinary team, then we at one of our uh, multidisciplinary institutions are happy to help out and collaborate with your, with your local doctors. Very good point. And I think this is what NetRS is about too, you know, is to give you access to, you know, like specialty centers. I would highly encourage second or third opinions. Nowadays, things can be done virtually, right, uh, quite often. So you don't even have to travel. So if you're not sure about the treatment you are getting locally, I would highly encourage to go see one of us or like one of the multiple specialized net centers that we have in the United States. So I'll close this up. Thank you so much to our panelists. I think this was a really, really great discussion. I hope that our patients and the families of our patients will enjoy the treatment sequencing uh, panel discussion, and we will see you very soon. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Michelle Kang Kim. Uh, professor of Medicine and co-director of the Center for Carcinoid and Neuroendocrine Tumors at the Mount Sinai Hospital. I'm also Vice Chair for Faculty Affairs in the Department of Medicine. My life's work has been to study neuroendocrine tumors, namely the outcomes and the improvement of prediction of outcomes uh, in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Our project is actually a really um, 
uh, innovative project. I'm extremely excited about it. Um, it involves um, collaboration with our pathology colleagues and our uh, computational scientists who leverage their expertise in systems pathology, ensuring that features that perhaps have been described in a more subjective way are now described in a more objective way that can actually be assessed automatically and digitally with computers. We have limited markers and limited methods to be able to understand how are patients going to do in the short term, in the long term, and how can we best treat them. So um, our project actually proposes to use something that every patient has, which is a biopsy, and to evaluate certain features with a systems pathology approach. And that means that um, essentially we are using artificial intelligence and other machine learning techniques to be able to systematically look at features under the microscope um, that will help us hopefully in uh, providing additional information, um, again, in predicting outcomes for patients and in understanding which patients perhaps can best be treated with which treatments. And so um, this collaboration is just a start, I think, of something that can be much bigger uh, and we hope will lead to um, a future work that will be funded by uh, the federal government, by foundation, and also perhaps using clinical trials. I'm such a believer in this project because I do think that it will add uh, to the field substantially. Um, and essentially, you know, what we're looking for is that existing um, classification systems such as STAGE, such as GRADE, and such, some of our other biomarkers, that those are all fine, well and good, um, but we can do better than that. In this era of personalized medicine, um, you know, we should be able to predict more finely how patients can, uh, you know, can understand how they'll do in the future, and therefore that this is going to add valuable information um, at the time of diagnosis that will be very objective and clear cut. Something that I have realized with um, my over a decade of experience in this field is that the net community is very special. Um, it is unusually involved um, in every respect from the patients and the patient advocates to um, the physicians who um, have really demonstrated a life commitment to this work. Um, and so um, this work could not take place without the support, the very generous support um, of NetRF um, and our patients um, and donors. I'm often actually uh, told by other investigators in other fields that um, it seems like there is a particularly tight community and um, that we seem to have more research grants considering what a rare, uh, relatively rare condition this is. And I think that's largely due to um, the advocacy um, and the belief, I think, by everyone involved, again, from patients to physicians to scientists, that you know we all do our part because no one else can do it because there are so few of us relative to other cancers and other diseases. We hope you enjoyed meeting one of our NetRF grantees. Now, let's welcome Dr. Carol Semrad from the University of Chicago Medicine to discuss managing GI symptoms. Dr. Semrad is a gastroenterologist and specialist in small bowel diseases. She will be speaking about more than an upset stomach, managing GI symptoms. I would like to thank Elise and Dr. Koitgen for inviting me to give this talk today. I'm going to speak to more than an upset stomach managing GI symptoms. Neuroendocrine neoplasms are rare and they occur in various organs, most commonly the pancreas and the intestine. They can be well differentiated tumors or invasive cancers and they present with diverse GI symptoms. Tumors that produce a hormone, patients can present with diarrhea, malabsorption, or in the case of gastronoma, where there's excessive acid secretion, peptic ulcer disease, and reflux. 
On the other hand, non-functional tumors often grow and present with intestinal obstruction with symptoms of abdominal pain or bloating. They can ulcerate and cause GI bleeding, or they can block the bile duct and cause jaundice or pancreatitis. There are also surgery-related complications of neuroendocrine tumors, mainly diarrhea and malabsorption. Since diarrhea is one of the main consequences of neuroendocrine tumors, I thought I'd speak today about the causes of diarrhea. So in terms of tumors that produce hormones, these hormones either increase intestinal fluid secretion, they can impair digestion in the lumen of the intestine, or they can increase small intestinal motility that can result in diarrhea and malabsorption. On the other hand, in those who have pancreatic resections, these patients have decreased enzyme, pancreatic enzymes, altered digestion, and rapid transit of nutrients. When there's small bowel resection, patients have loss of surface area for nutrient and fluid absorption. The symptoms of malabsorption and diarrhea include, for malabsorption, gas bloating, diarrhea, weight loss, and greasy stools that either stick to the toilet bowl or look like oil droplets in the toilet water. With significant fluid secretion in the intestine, these individuals can present with dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities. And then there's vitamin and mineral deficiencies which can present as anemia, neurologic symptoms, night blindness, rash, or a change in taste. And this occurs when patients have significant malabsorption. I thought it important to review the physiology of the intestine to show you what the intestine is faced with on a daily basis. Every day, about eight liters of fluid enter the digestive tract. Only two of those liters are from oral intake. The rest is from saliva, gastric secretions, biliary secretions, pancreatic enzymes and secretions, and intestinal fluid. And the small intestine must absorb 80% of that, seven or so of those liters, whereas the large intestine has to absorb the rest, which is 1.4 liters, and otherwise individuals will have diarrhea if this normal physiology doesn't occur. It's also important to review the sites of nutrient absorption. The intestine is fairly smart. It is long, 600 centimeters in length. And overall, most nutrients can be absorbed throughout the small bowel, but there are exceptions. In particular, in the distal ileum, vitamin B12 and bile salts can only be absorbed in this distal position. And this will become important when we talk about small bowel resections. I put a box here to highlight the end of the small bowel, which we'll be talking about next. So first, let me talk about the medical treatment of tumor-related diarrhea. This is, I'm sure, covered in another lecture, but to control just the symptoms of the tumor alone, there's the long-acting somatostatin analogs, which decrease the effect of the hormones being secreted, and those are octreotide or lantreotide. And then there are these newer targeted therapies to actually decrease tumor growth, the mTOR inhibitor, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and the peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, which is used when people fail these long-acting somatostatin analogs for treatment. I'm next going to turn to pancreas surgery because, again, these are common surgeries done for neuroendocrine tumors. The first is uh, the example of a tumor that would be confined to the distal pancreas. As you can see in the image here under yellow, it says part removed. So individuals who have a tumor that grows only in the end of the pancreas, the surgeon can take out just the end of the pancreas and leave the head of the pancreas that uh, connects to the bile duct and empties into the duodenum intact. However, In those who have a tumor that grows in the head of the pancreas, which would be on the left, that blue area of the pancreas, those individuals, because of the blood flow, have to have the entire head of the pancreas and the duodenum removed. And the tail of the pancreas has to be repositioned into the end part of the small bowel, and the bile then drains 
at a separate area into the small bowel. And you can see that on the cartoon, you lose that pylorus oftentimes when individuals have Whipple surgery, which is important for gastric emptying to control gastric emptying. So now let's get on to the consequences of a pancreas resection. So here's the first case. It's a distal pancreatectomy. So in these individuals, they will have decreased enzymes for digestion because half of the pancreas is gone. That results in fat malabsorption and diarrhea. It's also interesting that the islet cells are predominantly positioned in the end of the pancreas, so diabetes is more common with the distal pancreatectomy. And the treatment in these individuals are supplemental pancreatic enzymes to improve digestion and there, thereby improve absorption and lessen diarrhea. On the other hand, in the so-called Whipple surgery where the head of the pancreas is removed, now you can see the anatomy that where the tail of the pancreas empties into the intestine and where the bile duct from the liver empties into the intestine and where the food from the stomach empties into the intestine, they're at remote areas instead of being clustered right next to each other. And this decreases first again the enzymes for digestion and there's what's called impaired mixing of food with digestive enzymes such that it's not as efficient and that impacts on absorption and malabsorption. Then there's rapid, rapid emptying of the stomach, the so-called dumping syndrome, which can very quickly cause food to move through the small bowel to the point where it can't be absorbed. And lastly, uh, this all can result and frequently results in weight loss in patients who have Whipple surgeries. Treatment is to change your eating to frequent small meals, avoid simple sugars, add the supplemental pancreatic enzymes, and take a daily vitamin and mineral supplement. If weight loss becomes very rapid early on after this surgery, sometimes we need to give parenteral nutrition so that we can provide nutrition support until the digestive tract is working better. I'm next going to talk about small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. This is the most common tumor of the small bowel, and it often involves the distal ileum with or without lymph nodes and the mesentery, and oftentimes there's multiple tumors. The clinical presentation is abdominal pain, small bowel obstruction, or GI bleeding, and resection is usually surgically. We cannot endoscopically remove these tumors because they're growing from under the lining and the small bowel has a very thin wall, so it's not usually safe to remove these endoscopically unless they're very small. The consequences of ileal resection include diarrhea, malabsorption, and vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And I want to show you two cartoons here. The blue is what's ghosted out or removed in the resection. So there's two scenarios long term. There's the limited ileal resection where less than 100 centimeters is resected. And here, bile salt absorption and B12 absorption is usually pretty preserved. So in these patients, a regular diet and a multiple vitamin is standard in terms of dietary therapy. And then either we give a bile salt binder called cholestyramine or an anti-motility agent to slow down movement through the small intestine. And we monitor patients for their bone density, fat-soluble vitamin status, vitamin B12, and for urine oxalate because individuals can, in this setting, develop oxalate stones. The second scenario is the ileal resection with greater than 100 centimeters resected. Here, the bile salts and the B12 can no longer be absorbed in the small bowel, and bile salts are particularly needed for fat and fat-soluble vitamin absorption. So here, you want to change your diet to a low-fat and low-oxalate diet, so that would be a high-complex carbohydrate diet supplement with vitamin B12 and a multivitamin and mineral, take extra calcium in the diet, and an anti-motility agent, again, to slow movement through the intestine to improve absorption. And then cholestyramine or a bile salt binder can be used, but one must be careful because that may bind up more of your bile salts and worsen your fat malabsorption. And the monitoring is for bone density, fat-soluble vitamins, and urine oxalate. So in summary, GI symptoms can be a sign of neuroendocrine tumor or a consequence of surgery. 
Diarrhea is the most common GI symptom. Tumor-targeted therapy includes the somatostatin analogs and the new therapies, which can significantly lessen diarrhea and malabsorption. And then there's the post-resection management, which includes for ileal resection, a change in your diet, bile salt binders, and anti-motility agents. For pancreatic resection, there's diet and pancreatic enzyme supplementation. And of course, monitoring for vitamin and mineral deficiencies that need to be supplemented. But the important part here is you need lifelong monitoring to avoid malnutrition and these vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So it's important to be monitored lifelong for health because we rather prevent problems than try to deal with them when they occur. So on that note, um, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to answering any questions you have. From Cedar sinai Cancer Institute, we welcome Dr. Suki Pada. Dr. Pada is the Director of Thoracic Medical Oncology and she is going to discuss lung neuroendocrine tumors. Hi, my name is Suki Pada. I'm a thoracic medical oncologist at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. It's my pleasure to be with you here today to discuss lung neuroendocrine tumors, or lung nuts, for the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation. So what are the epidemiologic trends of lung neuroendocrine tumors? Well, what we know is that lung neuroendocrine tumors are the fastest rising neuroendocrine tumor in incidence, and also the top three of neuroendocrine tumors in terms of prevalence. So now let's learn the language. How are lung nets classified? So lung nets are classified based on the following features. First is, does it look like a lung nut? Does it have neuroendocrine morphology? Second is with regards to mitotic count uh, per surface area of two millimeters squared, which gives us an indication of how many cells are dividing or growing within the specimen. Then there is examination of the presence or absence of necrosis, meaning are there areas of tumor that have died within the specimen, indicating that the cancer is overgrowing the blood supply. Although KI-67 may be performed in a lung neuroendocrine tumor, it is not used to definitively classify them. So there's two main categories of lung neuroendocrine tumors. On the right, on, we have poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, which include small cell lung cancer and also large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. On the left, we have well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, which will be the focus of this talk, examining both typical carcinoid tumor and atypical carcinoid tumor. So how do lung nets present? So 20 to 30% present peripherally, meaning outside of an airway. And in that setting, there are generally no associated symptoms, and the tumor has been incidentally found when imaging has been performed for another reason. However, 60 to 70% have central tumors at presentation, and these occur within the airway and often cause downstream airway collapse. And because of this, they cause symptoms such as cough, uh, shortness of breath, wheezing, recurrent pneumonia, and sometimes even coughing up blood, otherwise known as hemoptysis. A minority of patients will present with a functional syndrome, such as carcinoid syndrome, where the tumor is overproducing serotonin, or Cushing syndrome, where the tumor may be overproducing a hormone called ACTH. So what is the standard workup for a suspected lung neuroendocrine tumor? As you saw from the last slide, imaging is key, both CT imaging of the chest, but also ensuring that we're in imaging the liver with a multiphasic CT abdomen or MRI abdomen. After reviewing the imaging, we choose what would be the best place to biopsy to get the answer, but also safest for the patient. Next, there's a pathology review. And if we have a suspicion that this is a carcinoid tumor based on the biopsy specimen, there is an additional imaging study called somatostatin receptor imaging. And some images of that are on your right. And so we used to perform uh, octrea scans, which used to light up neuroendocrine tumors. But you can see in this image, it's a very fuzzy sort of low resolution scan. So now there's somatostatin receptor PETs, uh, which are also useful for patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors. 
And uh, we have an example of the 68 gallium dodatate PET showing the liver metastases much more clearly in the same patients. And if we have a suspicion of a functional syndrome, we will also do some additional blood and or urine workup to definitively diagnose. So how are lung nets treated? Like other neuroendocrine tumors, a multidisciplinary tumor board review at diagnosis is key. And this includes our surgeons, our nuclear medicine physicians, our pathologists, and our medical oncologists, among a variety of other specialists. So what about treatment of surgery for lung neuroendocrine tumors? What are the indications? So the indication for surgery is really if the disease is local and can be completely resected. And that includes not only the primary lung tumor, but any associated lymph nodes on the same side of that lung tumor. We also evaluate for surgical candidacy, meaning the functional status of the patient going to be able to tolerate the risk of surgery, is the lung function good? Oftentimes specialized tests like pulmonary function tests are performed. And depending on a patient's history, even cardiac testing or testing of the heart is performed to ensure the heart is strong enough. Ideally, the surgery is performed by a board certified thoracic surgeon. And that's because they have extra specialization and of course, surgeries within the thorax. There's different surgical approaches for a lung neuroendocrine tumor from open to minimally invasive, even with a robot. There are different types of surgical resections. And it's also very important that the nodes are interrogated and dissected during the surgery because we don't wanna miss any micrometastatic disease. What if lung nets are unresectable and are metastatic? Then what are the treatment options? So first, I'd like to note that active surveillance may be an option, and that means meeting with uh, the physician on uh, a routine basis and also performing imaging. What are the decision factors we use to start systemic therapy for a patient with a lung net? We look at the pace of the disease, how quickly is the disease moving? We look at the tumor burden, where is the tumor located? How much burden is there? Does a patient have any disease-related symptoms? And is there evidence of a functional syndrome like carcinoid syndrome where treatment is necessary? And of course, this is a shared decision with the patient. What are the treatment options and what do they target? First, a somatostatin receptor is a target, either with somatostatin analogs, either octreotide or lanreotide. A peptide receptor radionuclide therapy or PRT is also an option. Lutetium-177 dotatate is uh, one of the approved options for GEP nets, but for patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors, we do have a clinical trial that just activated that I'll go through with you on the next slide. Another target is the mTOR pathway, which can be abnormal in patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors. And there's a therapy there called Everolimus. It's a pill therapy and in fact is the only FDA approved therapy for patients with lung net. And then there's other options, chemotherapy. There's a variety of chemotherapy options I've listed. And there's a question of other uh, utility of other targets, such as anti-angiogenic therapy that targets abnormal tumor vasculature or immunotherapy, which uses the immune system to try to treat the tumor. And that may be beneficial in a subset of patients with this tumor type. So this is the trial design of uh, PRT. This is going to be the first prospective trial of PRT in patients with lung uh, neuroendocrine tumors. We have to be able to see the tumor on a dotatate uh, PET scan. And uh, the diagnosis, of course, has to be a uh, lung carcinoid tumor, either typical carcinoid or atypical carcinoid tumor. And patients in the study are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive the investigational agent, which is Lutathera, or PRT, versus Everolimus, our standard of care control arm treatment. And of course, we want to examine the efficacy, how effective these two approaches are and how they compare against each other. We, um, when we were designing this trial, it was very important to us that patients were able to cross over to the investigational arm if they experienced progression on the Everolimus arm. So this study just activated the overall PI is Dr. Tom Hope at UCSF, and I am the uh, co-PI. 
So finally, I want to touch on an uh, entity called diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, or DIPNAC. There's two ways to diagnose this, either pathologically or clinically. So let's look at the uh, figure in the center. So this is a pathologic diagnosis. It's often a spectrum of disease, including neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia on the far left, which is sitting within the airways, uh, essentially neuroendocrine cell overgrowths. You often see tumorlets or these very small carcinoid tumors, less than five millimeters. And sometimes this condition is also associated with carcinoid tumors. So this is a pathological diagnosis of DIPNEC, but sometimes this is hard to diagnose. So there's also a clinical definition. And oftentimes patients will have symptoms for years, even decades related to airway obstruction, cough, shortness of breath, wheezing, often will carry a misdiagnosis of asthma. And there are also some classic imaging findings we look at uh, demonstrating small airway disease. And sometimes we can see bilateral lung nodules indicating these small tumorlets or even carcinoid tumors. So treatment is yet to be defined in this uh, condition, but we uh, have seen some improvement uh, with somatostatin analogs, not only from a Mayo Clinic study, but also from a Stanford study that was led by one of the fellows there, Dr. Thomas Sun. So because this is a evolving disease in terms of our knowledge and how we best treat and how we best manage, sometimes guidelines are a very helpful resource for not only uh, the physicians, but also for our patients. So this is um, a particular guideline from the Commonwealth and North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, one of the most recent lung net uh, guidelines that's been published in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology. So I'd really like to thank you for your time and I'm open to questions in the Q&A. Thank you again. I'm gonna uh, briefly um, introduce each one of you. I'm gonna start with Dr. Uh, Semrat, who is a uh, GI specialist for uh, small bowel disease um, at the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Uh, Suki Pada is a thoracic oncologist at Cedar sinai Dr. Um, Eric Mitra is a nuclear medicine specialist at uh, OHSU. Dr. Oz um, Ahmed is an um, interventional uh, radiologist um, at the University of Chicago. Dr. Thor Half Danison. Uh, is a uh, neuroendocrine tumor um, oncologist at Mayo Clinic, and Dr. Liao is also a neuroendocrine tumor oncologist um, at the University of Chicago. So welcome to all of you. I'm really excited to have you here today. Uh, we've had quite a bit of uh, questions that were asked. So we had over 45 questions, and obviously we only have about 20 minutes to do this. So I've selected uh, some of the uh, uh, those questions out. Um, I'm going to start right up front with, like I said before, being a little selfish and asking myself a question, um, which is, as, as the um, only surgeon here on the panel, which is, uh, or was, do neuroendocrine tumors increase after surgery? Um, and I think uh, it's important for um, all of our patients to know that there's absolutely no data to suggest this. Um, it's not the first time that we've uh, heard this that um, like patients are concerned that if you do surgery, you spread the tumor, or if you do um, interventional procedures that um, asked us, for example, uh, you know, that you could spread tumor cells and that your tumor would progress. Uh, there's absolutely no data suggested that that is actually a real phenomenon. So I think it's really important to mention that to our patients. Now, um, let's move ahead to the next question, which is sort of directly and like indirectly related to surgery, but also I think uh, in larger, uh, in a larger audience, to the uh, neuroendocrine tumor patients. Um, so there was a study that was presented at Nanets uh, uh, this year uh, that showed the safety of managing a neuroendocrine tumor with uh, like carcinogenic symptoms in the operating room without any octreotide. So um, I could tell you that at the University of Chicago, as long as you're on long-acting octreotide, we don't give additional. Um, octreotide during surgery, but I would be curious to see uh, 
Thor, for example, how if somebody has a dentist appointment or a procedure that they need to um, undergo and they ask you, they call you the night before, they're like, oh my God, I completely forgot. But, you know, should I be on a triotide? Should an triotide drip be run uh, during these procedures? What do you tell them? So what I tell them, it's a great question. So I tell them that typically if you're on a long acting on triotide uh, injection monthly or every three weeks, it's probably not needed. And, uh, and I think the risk of a carcinoid crisis triggered by especially minor procedures is very, very, very low. So I, I think most patients will not need any additional octreotide. And for patients who have neuroendocrine tumors and are not on so many analogs and don't have carcinoid syndrome, I think the risk is very, very low as well. So I think uh, for most, the vast majority of people don't need it. Fantastic. Thank you, Thor. Let's move on to the next question. This is something for Dr. Um, Ahmed. Um, so if um, embolization was done up an initial diagnosis, uh, can this procedure be repeated um, throughout my net journey? Yeah, Xavier, great question. Um, frequently asked this as well. Um, the short answer is yes. You can um, uh, you know, frequently undergo multiple interventional procedures. And um, really what we're guided by in terms of our ability to do um, uh, a second or a repeat intervention is specifically how healthy are you as a person, meaning are you able to carry out your uh, normal daily activities? Um, you're not bed bound, things like that. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're doing okay. And then specifically, because most of our procedures are specifically in the liver, um, particularly embolization, um, we want to make sure your, your liver is healthy as well. So as long as your um, lab values suggest that your liver is still, you know, doing well, which um, more often than not it is, um, you are uh, frequently a candidate for a repeat procedure. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Oz. Um, we'll move to um, Andy. So uh, one of the patients was asking, um, does um, octreotide lose um, efficacy over time? Yeah, that's a good question. So we use octreotide uh, mainly for two reasons. One is to control symptoms related to hormonal overproduction, so carcinoid syndrome. Um, but the other is that, you know, octreotide can actually slow down the tumor growth. And like other treatments that we have for NETS, um, you know, each treatment um, tends to be effective for a, a given amount of time. And that varies, um, can vary widely from patient to patient. You know, for, for one patient, octreotide may, may hold the tumor um, in check for many, many years and even longer than that. But then for others, it may only do so for months. And we know that, um, you know, tumors definitely um, change and evolve over time during the treatment. And that may perhaps be, you know, why octreotide may lose its efficacy eventually. Great. Do, are there certain specific subtype of tumors um, that you know that, uh, that, you know, response better or longer uh, like triotide, And I'm going to actually let you answer a question and I'm going to uh, ask the same question to uh, Suki about lung nets. Uh, what is the data for like, uh, long acting triotide and, and uh, lung nets? Yeah, so generally, um, you know, these um, patients who respond better to octreotide, their tumors generally have... Um, you know, they're well differentiated or moderately differentiated, lower grade tumors, and that they, you know, they express a lot of the somatostatin receptor, which is what the drug binds to. Thank you, Andy. And Suki, what, what do you think in terms of uh, long acting octreotide and lung nets? That's a great question, specifically for our patients with lung nets, because we don't have the same high level data that we do in patients with gap nets as it relates to octreotide or lanreotide. Um, although uh, Dr. Reedy at the NANAT symposium this year did present the analysis from the ambitious SPINET trial, which was uh, initially planned as a randomized study of lanreotide versus placebo, but they had a lot of difficulty with accruing patients to that study so then they had an expansion arm of uh, patients who received lanreotide without randomization. And there we did see um, that there was evidence of prolonged progression-free survival in patients with lung nuts, including typical carcinoids and atypical carcinoids. 
although that the benefit may be more robust in patients with typical carcinoids, which also speaks to, I think, the biology of the differences between typical and atypical carcinoid. So it's definitely a treatment option uh, for our patients with lung nuts. Thank you so much, Suki. Um, all right, I think the next question will go to um, Dr. Hafdan Asen Thor. Um, one patient was wondering if there's any benefit um, of a continuous infusion um, of octreotide versus um, octreotide um, every 14 days. And I think we have to mention that traditionally octreotide or long acting octreotide is given um, every 28 days. So I'm assuming uh, the question also relates to the fact uh, that like that particular patient um, uh, has been prescribed octreotide uh, on a shorter um, interval, whether it's for tumor control or for symptom control. So great question. So uh, for continuous infusion of triotide, uh, I think it might uh, in uh, extremely rare cases be useful if, if you have a completely uncontrollable carcinoid syndrome. But keep in mind that often you can do something regionally with embolization or with surgery to reduce uh, the production of serotonin and other uh, chemicals. So when I was at the University of Iowa, this was used uh, fairly frequently. I have uh, I left there eight years ago. I have not not once used the continuous infusion of triotide since then. I will also say that we now have data on uh, landriotide every two weeks from the Clarinet Forte trial. This was a small uh, trial that looked at uh, yeah. at the patients who progressed uh, or had progressive disease on uh, conventional dose landriotide, and they were given landriotide every two weeks instead of every four weeks. As I recall, it didn't really look much at symptom control. Control, but the tumor control, there was definitely a signal of this uh, being modestly uh, active. But uh, to answer the question, it typically not uh, much role for a continuous infusion of triotide. Thank you so much, Thor. Um, all right, let's move on to the PRT uh, chapter, so to speak. Plenty of questions um, on that uh, thematic. So the first question um, is going to go to you, um, Eric, if you don't mind answering, what percentage of people gain stability after PR, PRT and why doesn't it work for um, every patient who gets it? Yeah, great question. And uh, it's a very difficult one to answer. I think it really gets to the heterogeneity of uh, neuroendocrine tumors, which we all know about. You know, So um, if you look at the data from the NETR1 trial, which was specific to patients with gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, specifically midgut, um, the, you know, most patients, the majority of patients did have a response, but even then the duration you know, is different depending on uh, the, each of the patients. Then if you look at all the different subtypes uh, of neuroendocrine tumor and the uh, origin, the grade, the distribution of the disease, the degree of somatostatin receptor expression, there's a tremendous number of reasons. Uh, it's quite effective, but uh, not for everyone. Why don't we go to Suki? What do you think? Uh, let's talk about lung nets and PRT. Has that been something that's been used and does it work well? Yeah, so PRT has definitely been used in uh, lung nets, but uh, again, not studied in the same sort of robust way that we have from the NADR1 study for patients with uh, gastrointestinal nets. So what we know from you know, single institution or multi-institution cohort studies is that a subgroup of patients with lung nets will respond. Response rates have been described somewhere between 10 to 30%. Um, time to progression has been described anywhere from 10 to 30 months. Uh, so we really need high level data to guide this treatment for patients with lung nets and also how to sequence amongst our other treatments. So uh, Tom Hope, who's a nuclear medicine physician at UCSF and myself, are leading a clinical trial uh, through Alliance and also in collaboration with ECOG Akron that are trying to definitively answer what is the role of PRT in patients with lung nets. So um, this study was just activated in uh, September, it includes patients with typical and atypical carcinoids. Um, we're going to be um, examining the uh, somatostatin recept po receptor positivity for selection onto study. And then there's a randomization to standard dose uh, lutetium-177 dotatate versus the current standard of care Everlimus. And it's important to note that even if patients are randomized to the Everlimus arm, 
uh, they would be eligible for crossover at the time of uh, progression, or at least assessment for crossover to the uh, lutetium arm. Great. Thank you, Suki. And uh, we're looking forward to see that data. Um, all right, let's move on to Dr. Semrat. Um, so that's a question that's sort of uh, a challenging one, I think, which is a lot of the challenges that, uh, that I'm sure you see with neuroendocrine tumor patients and GI symptoms. That particular patient says, I have constant severe gas and bloating, possibly from a tiny net causing uh, nerve damage and fluid buildup. Uh, has anyone had this problem in patients? So I think this also comes down, uh, Dr. Samra, to the point, you know, how do we really differentiate what is net related and what's not? Um, and what is the role that uh, like you can offer patients to try to help them? So first of all, gas bloating is a very common symptom. So it's hard to pinpoint that into a certain process related to net, but a few ideas here. First of all, I'm not aware that small nets damage nerves. Um, if you have significant tumor burden in the, of the mesentery or the peritoneal cavity, the bowel has to constantly move to digest and absorb properly, and it can get locked into position so that it just can't do its to and fro motion and absorb properly. And that once we start malabsorbing nutrients, they go to the colon. And then of course, gas and bloating is created. The other is, I'm not sure about this individual patient, but octreotide. So octreotide, you know, let's just talk about carcinoid and net or, or carcinoid syndrome. The mechanism of diarrhea and carcinoid syndrome is hypermotility of the bowel. And so their high dose octreotide can block that effect. But in people who might be taking it to prevent tumor progression there, they might get paralyzed bowel from these high doses, and that can lead to small bowel bacterial overgrowth. So again, you have to take it in context of who this individual is and what was done. And lastly, clearly surgeries, whether they be pancreatic or small bowel resections, can lead to the gas bloating, a number of mechanisms there as well. So I think the most important thing is the specific history of this patient and trying to sort out what's the contributing factor to these symptoms. Thank you so much. And I think you bring up a really good point is try to figure out what is causing certain things, right? We have a lot of uh, like neuroendocrine tumor patients that have had all kinds of therapies yes. um, or no therapy or just a history of a neuroendocrine tumor that was resected and uh, and sometimes things are related to like neuroendocrine tumor disease, but sometimes they aren't and there's something else going on. And I think um, what we are really um, like excited uh, to have at the University of Chicago is somebody like you, and I'm sure you all have that in your institution that specializes in small bowel uh, like disease and really trying to um, understand and sort out. And it can be, I'm sure, sometimes a really long process that can take some time um, to try to figure out what exactly is yeah. causing the symptoms. It is, but it's history is everything. And then sort of a systematic approach to the symptoms, what makes it better or worse. It's really kind of an art more than a science, if you will. And in net type patients, they just right. have a lot of possibilities. Right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Eric, another question for you. Thoughts on um, alpha PRT? We hear it over and over again. All our patients walk into our offices. I'm sure Andy, Thor, you know, you've all heard Suki probably. You've all heard about it. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, alpha PRT? It's a hot subject, but is that about to hit the market or how good is it? Is it better than the standard PRT? What are your thoughts? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, alpha PRT, we're all very excited about it. Um, it's basically a, a larger molecule, which can uh, cause more damage to the cells. Um, and it's, it's um, in clinical trials right now. So we're still a few years away from it, but all the data does look uh, very promising, I would say. Also, it has very low toxicity, which is important for uh, patients who are being treated multiple times. So let's do uh, one more question. Andy, um, is... Uh, is it true that um, everolimus should not be used with someone that has carcinoid syndrome? And maybe Thor can weigh in there as well as the last question for the session. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So 
um, you know, it's not that everolimus is contraindicated or harmful in net patients with carcinoid syndrome. I think what you're referring to um, is um, years ago, many years ago, there was this trial called the Radiant 2 study. Um, so this was a phase three clinical trial looking at everolimus plus alpha LAR versus placebo plus alpha LAR in patients who have advanced nets with carcinoid syndrome. And the primary endpoint for that study was um, progression-free survival. So, you know, the time that the treatment keeps the tumor stable for. And um, numerically, there was an improvement in the Everolimus arm. I think there was like a five-month difference between the two arms in terms of improvement in progression-free survival. But statistically, it did not meet um, statistical significance. So I think that's where this question is coming from. But, you know, you have to keep in mind that, you know, there is definitely a numerical improvement and, um, you know, patients are not statistics, they're not numbers. And, you know, just because it is not statistically significant doesn't mean there can't be a clinically meaningful um, um, improvement. Uh, great. Thank you. And actually, I just got uh, noticed that we have time for one more. So, so I think I'll uh, have you one answer that one if that's okay. Um, one patient's asking, does higher um, SUV uptake on the gallium or the copper dotate equate to better and longer response to um, octreotide therapy? So great question. And, uh, and I have not seen really conclusive data, but the brighter the uptake there is, uh, presumably the more receptors on, are on the surface of uh, the tumor cell. So yes, it would make sense that uh, we would see a longer uh, tumor control the, and really brighter tumors, but it hasn't really been conclusively shown. I'd like to ask uh, Eric if he's heard uh, any data on that. I would say that, you know, it's certainly a certain cutoff is important. So when we, we commonly use the Krenning score for uptake uh, on scans, and so it has, it does have to be above a certain level, but you're right that beyond that certain level, then we don't have great data on if, if it continues to be a linear relationship or it sort of drops off after. It actually should be fairly easy to study. Maybe an idea for a sort yeah, of... Maybe we uh, should yeah. all get together and study it. Mm -hmm. There we go. You see, these costs are very useful. Our patients uh -huh. always uh, mm -hmm. like push us to study the questions that they want answers to that sometimes we may forget or like overlook or we think it's uh, you know not that important, but clearly this is a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, we learn from our patients um, every day, I guess, right? So that's a really important uh, message here. I really appreciate um, all of your time today, especially on a weekend. Um, it's a beautiful day in Chicago for once. Um, and uh, we, I, it was really great to, you know, uh, like spend this time with you. Thank you uh, to um, all of you uh, to also take the time to uh, record uh, your talks. I think they really were phenomenal. I'm sure they'll be really helpful uh, like to our patients um, in the future. So with that, thank you very much. Um, and I hope to see you guys soon. Um, and I will hand this back to uh, Rich at this point. Thank you. We received a lot of requests for information on liver function and nets. So we are happy to welcome Dr. Helen Tay, Professor of Medicine in the section of gastroenterology at the University of Chicago Medicine as well as medical director of the Adult Liver Transplant Program. She will talk to us about keeping your liver healthy. Hello, everybody. I'm Helen Tay. I'm a hepatologist at the University of Chicago Medicine, and I'm grateful to the organizers of this wonderful educational program for giving me the opportunity to participate in it. My task today is to talk to you about keeping your liver healthy. This is the outline of my presentation and we'll briefly cover these four areas to talk about the function of the liver, interpretation of liver chemistry tests, preventing preventable liver diseases, and the impact of medications and herbal supplements on the liver. The liver is an amazing organ. It covers a very wide plethora of functions that the body needs. It is the battery pack of our body and works as the powerhouse of our entire body. The liver is responsible for converting calories that we eat into energy so that we can utilize that for our bodily functions 
as well as our physical activities. The liver is the one that maintains the blood sugar levels. The liver also produces proteins for clotting whenever we have wounds or bleeding, and it produces hormones, antibodies, and carriers of substances that has to be distributed throughout the body. It converts medications to active forms to allow the medications to work, or for those that are already in active forms, it detoxifies those medicines to allow them to be safely eliminated from our body through our urine or our stool. The liver produces bile that aids in the digestion and absorption of fat and fat-soluble vitamins. It also removes toxins from the body, including ammonia, which is a byproduct of our daily cell turnover. The liver can also store some vitamins and minerals, and it has cells that are specific for filtering bacteria. So when somebody is having a liver panel drawn, that's a blood test, it will usually show all these enzymes that are listed here, as well as the bilirubin. So let's talk a little bit about each one of them. The AST and ALT are enzymes that convert amino acids from one form to another in the liver. These are contained within the liver cells, and it tends to leak out whenever the cell membrane integrity is compromised. However, these enzymes are also made by other organs, such as the muscles, and it can also be released by red blood cells. The alkaline phosphatase is another enzyme that is found in the liver, but this time it's secreted by the bile duct cells. This enzyme increases in the blood level when there is a bile flow problem, but like the AST and ALT, it can also be produced by organs outside of the liver, such as the bone, the intestine, or the placenta. Bilirubin is a substance that is a component of bile and it adds color to our stool and our urine. This substance becomes elevated in situations where there's severe liver cell damage or severe compromise in the bile flow. So what comprises a healthy liver? A healthy liver has the correct cell components in it and no outsiders allowed within the vicinity. The liver that is healthy can regenerate and can undergo a lot of different treatments or even surgical resections without much compromise in its function. We can technically lose about 70% of our liver and still manage to regenerate what has been lost and survive with the remaining 30%. So if you all remember this mythology about Prometheus who stole the fire from Zeus, and as a punishment, Zeus chained him to the rocks and had an eagle come and eat at his liver every day. But because the liver kept regenerating, the eagle had to keep coming every day with no end in sight. So this is one of those mythologies that actually had a scientific basis as much as it has been so long ago. Liver diseases that can be prevented should be prevented to keep a healthy liver. And these diseases could include alcoholic liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and viral hepatitis. When we take medications that are necessary, but medications that are also known to have a higher risk for causing liver toxicity, it would be prudent to be monitored while these medications are on the agenda. Lastly, I would actually advise extreme caution when taking herbal supplements in general. Herbal supplements are not subject to the same rigorous testing that the medications that are approved by the FDA are subjected to. And therefore, when they hit the shelves, their safety and efficacy is pretty much still up in the air. This slide shows uh, some examples of what happens to a liver that becomes unhealthy. So the first picture that we see here in the left upper corner is the picture of a normal liver under the microscope. You can see that the cells are pink, and they're filled up with their cytoplasm that is expected in a normal liver cell, and the dots there are the nuclei. The next picture in the middle is what we would see in a fatty liver disease patient. You can see that the uh, liver has somewhat been replaced by these holes, which actually are fat droplets that have been washed out during the processing of the specimen. And if you can just imagine having these fat in each cell will compromise the func function of that cell. And if there's a significant amount of it, such as what's shown here on this slide, then you can certainly cut down the liver function to a significant degree, and a liver like this would have trouble regenerating.
The last picture in the right lower corner here is a picture of a patient who has cirrhosis or severe scarring of the liver. This results from many different liver diseases, not simply just from alcohol alone, but this means that the scar tissue, which is what we see here as blue, has taken over a significant proportion of the liver and therefore the liver cells have been lost. And you can appreciate how much function you've also lost if you have this much scar tissue in the liver. Again, similar to the fatty liver, a liver like this would have trouble regenerating. So let's see what happens uh, with alcohol on the liver. So starting with a healthy liver, if the amounts of alcohol intake are quite significant to the point that it causes liver damage, it will do so by depositing fat in the liver and making the liver enlarged or big. The fat there will at some point elicit an immune response and inflammatory cells will come in and then generate fibrosis or scar tissue. And with the passage of time, the scar tissue adds up and then it becomes what we would now call cirrhosis of the liver or severe scarring of the liver. But then how do we know how much alcohol to drink to be within the safe zone? So the threshold amounts that have been calculated for men is about 30 grams of alcohol per day and for women about 10 to 20 grams per day. But how much do we really see in a drink? So this picture here depicts the approximate amount of alcohol in each drink, which is about 14 grams in a 12 ounce of beer, eight ounce of malt liquor, five ounces of table wine, or one and a half ounce of 80 proof spirits. So, so to translate that to what we would call drinks per day, basically a man can drink about two drinks per day and stay within a safe zone. And a woman can drink about one drink per day and stay in the safe zone but beyond that, one could certainly develop alcoholic liver disease. Of course, there are other factors that contribute to the development of alcoholic liver disease, including the presence of other liver diseases that would potentially allow a more progressive disease or some genetic predisposition as well. Now, some people develop fatty liver but never even touch alcohol. And this is a different disease entity called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease which will look exactly the same as alcoholic liver disease under the microscope, except that there is absolutely just no alcohol intake in some of these patients or very little alcohol intake in the others. So what we would see similar to the alcoholic liver disease is that this, the deposition of fat first, that's called hepatic steatosis or fatty liver. And then the spectrum continues to include those patients who may also have inflammatory cells and fibrosis or scar tissue, and that stage is now called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. And then as time goes on and the injury continues, those patients can then progress on to cirrhosis of the liver. You can appreciate that there are some reversibility from the stage of fatty liver and the stage of NASH for those who are able to improve their profile and get rid of the fat from the liver. But once cirrhosis has set in, unfortunately, it becomes irreversible. NASH or fatty liver disease or NAFLD happens to be the most common liver disease in our country. We probably have about 25% at least of our population with fatty liver. Why is that? Well, NASH or NAFLD is related to metabolic syndrome. What is metabolic syndrome? Metabolic syndrome is a conglomeration of different conditions that predispose an individual to stroke, heart disease, and diabetes. So these conditions include obesity or excess weight, particularly if the obesity is mostly around the middle or truncal or abdominal obesity. Hypertension, cholesterol abnormalities, particularly a high triglyceride or a low HDL cholesterol or high density lipoprotein, which is considered the good cholesterol, and resistance to insulin, which is a hormone that regulates the blood sugar levels for our body. And this could predispose to either a pre-diabetic state or move on to a full diabetic state. So for patients who have NAFLD or who are at risk for developing, developing NAFLD, there are some lifestyle choices that have to be made. And diet is certainly one of them. So the Mediterranean diet is the most common 
advocated diet for patients with fatty liver. I'll go over that in a little more detail in the next slide. But to keep the liver healthy, one should avoid fatty foods and keep saturated fat to less than 10% of the diet. Carbohydrates should be minimized to less than 50% of the total kilocalories consumed, and that means avoiding sweets, avoiding fructose, which is found in soda, avoiding processed carbohydrates, which are what we would see in white flour, pasta, and breakfast cereals. But luckily, for those of you who have um, a vice with coffee or, or a romance with coffee, coffee is protective for the liver. So that's good news. So this is a food pyramid for the Mediterranean diet, which starts with, at the bottom, having a, a healthy physical profile along with a healthy emotional relationship with the family, because you're supposed to eat with the family all the time. So the food that choices at the bottom here consists of whole grain bread, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds, as well as fruits and vegetables. And the fat of choice is olive oil. And for the sources of protein, it is seafood and fish, and with only moderate consumption of dairy products or poultry. But the big no-no here in the Mediterranean diet, which should only be consumed on a seldom or a very special occasion basis, are the meats and sweets. Now, what about coffee? Coffee truly has data that says that it reduces the risk for developing NAFL by 23%. And for those already with NAFL, coffee reduced the risk for fibrosis by 32%. And even older studies in hepatitis C patients had shown that coffee reduced the risk for disease progression to advanced hepatitis C by 53%. So three cups of black coffee a day keeps fatty liver away. Exercise also has its own role. It has been shown to show an improvement in uh, lipid levels as well as liver, liver enzymes. And it's interesting to see that there have been comparisons of different types of exercises done and its effects on the body function and liver enzymes. For example, aerobic exercises seem to have a broader effect in improving the lipid levels, liver enzymes, as well as the weight of the individual. Resistance exercises does improve lipid levels and liver enzymes, but not necessarily the weight, and high-intensity interval training improved liver enzymes alone. Viral hepatitis are now really not very common diseases anymore in the last decade because of all the breakthrough in medications that we have for treating them and for hepatitis C for curing it, but it still merits a mention just to make sure that we are able to uh, exercise caution to prevent these from happening. So hepatitis B is transmi transmitted mostly by sex in our country, and therefore practicing safe sex is the way to prevent this. It used to be transmitted by blood transfusions, but it's now being screened for, and therefore that has diminished very much. But in other countries with endemic hepatitis B, the transmission rate is usually from mother to child at childbirth. So screening of pregnant women is a standard of care as well, even here in the United States. But certainly there is a vaccine available for hepatitis B, so it behooves us to be vaccinated for hepatitis B as all children born in the last two or three decades have been subjected to this vaccination as part of the childhood immunization. Hepatitis C, on the other hand, is transmitted mostly by sharing of IV drug needles for those who still use IV drugs, and therefore making sure that the clean needles are used is imperative to prevent the transmission. Blood product screening has been done for hepatitis C and has diminished the transmission by this route, and sexual transmission is rare although possible. Moving forward to medications, of course, when we need medications, the benefit of the medication usually outweighs the risk of liver toxicity, which is extremely rare. However, there are still some medications that are more notorious than others in causing liver toxicity or injury, and it, it's prudent to be monitored for such if one is taking these kinds of medicines. So I have written some examples here of commonly used medications. It doesn't, of course, comprise the entire list, but the most common group is usually the antimicrobials or antibiotics. So isoniazid for one is a drug used to treat TB and has known liver toxicity. And minocycline is a drug that's used to treat acne that can also 
cause liver toxicity. Antiarrhythmics are drugs to treat irregular heart rates, and amiodarone is a common one. Immunosuppressants are drugs that are used to treat inflammatory conditions or immune-mediated conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, one of which is methotrexate. Anticonvulsants in the form of valproic acid can lead to liver damage. Anti-inflammatory, such as the clofenac sodium, and even cancer treatments such as tamoxifen, which is used to prevent recurrence of breast cancer. Now we're going into herbal supplements. This is more of a gray zone, even with less data than medications, and therefore it's very difficult to really determine their safety. But in a database that listed all the different causes of liver injury from herbal medications, the group that has the most uh, use uh, that led to liver injury happened to be in the medic uh, herbal supplements that were used for bodybuilding as well as depression management, followed by herbal supplements used for weight loss. We have to be cautious about what supplements we use, but there certainly have been a few that have been determined to be really safe for the liver. So one of this is omega-3 fatty acid or fish oil. This supplement has been shown to improve liver fat content, the cholesterol or lipid profile, and in the liver enzymes in patients with NAFLD or fatty liver. Silymarin or silibinin, which is commonly known as milk thistle, has decades of data on its safety, so absolutely safe for the liver. The only issue is we don't really have hard data to say that it could really help the liver, although I personally think it might help with some inflammation, but it does not take care of the underlying root of the problem. SAM-E or S-adenosyl L-methionine is uh, another supplement that has been shown to potentially reduce bilirubin and AST in patients with chronic liver disease, but it had no direct effect on the clinical outcome of that disease or that patient. Coenzyme Q may reduce liver enzymes as well in fatty liver, but its effect on the clinical outcome is also still unclear. So this list is perfectly safe for the liver, but whether or not they really do something seems to be only verified for the omega-3 fatty acid. So to summarize, a healthy liver can regenerate and can sustain itself through uh, treatments to the liver or even resections of the liver if needed for patients who have a neuroendocrine tumor that has metastasized to the liver. But to keep the liver healthy, we should prevent diseases that are potentially preventable. And we do this by moderation of alcohol consumption picking the right lifestyle choices to prevent or improve fatty liver, and to take precautions to avoid contraction of viral hepatitis. When taking medications that are known to have relatively higher risk for liver toxicity, it is prudent to be monitored with liver tests periodically while on those medications. But we should really be very wary of taking herbal supplements in general, unless the safety of those herbal supplements have really been well established. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. University of Chicago Medicine colleagues, Dr. Tessa Balich and Sean Petroda, team up to discuss the multidisciplinary management of bone metastases in this next presentation. Dr. Petroda is Assistant Professor of Radiation and Cellular Oncology, and Dr. Balich is Associate Professor and Orthopedic Residency Program Director in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Rehabilitation Medicine. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here today to talk with you about the multidisciplinary treatment of bone metastases from neuroendocrine tumors. In this session, I'll give you a brief introduction about bone metastases, talk a bit about how we evaluate these tumors in the bone, and share information about the multidisciplinary treatment of these tumors, focusing on surgery. About 15% of patients with neuroendocrine tumors will develop bone metastases during the course of their disease. These tumors are important for us to treat because they can be a source of significant pain for patients and may be a cause for worsening function and disability. When we consider treatment options for these tumors, we have a couple of goals in mind. We focus on improving pain that's been caused by bone tumors, work to maintain or improve function, and finally, try to provide some treatment for the local tumor in the bone. 
We're now going to talk about how these tumors are discovered, the radiology tests that we use to see them clearly, and then we'll dive into some of the treatments for them. Often, a patient will describe significant pain in a bone or joint. They'll describe the pain as being a deep ache. Occasionally, it wakes them at night or gets so bad that they have to use a cane or a walker. Sometimes, we unfortunately discover these tumors because the bone is broken through an abnormal area. Other times, we see them as an additional finding from an x-ray or scan that was done for another reason. The questions I ask my patients when I'm trying to understand the impact of a bone tumor focus on getting a sense of how bad the pain is, what the pain feels like, and how long it's been there, and how it's affecting my patient. It's also very important for me and my team to understand what cancer treatments my patient has been on as well. I then examine the area of pain where we know there is a bone tumor. If they haven't been done yet, radiology tests are then ordered to help us see exactly where the metastatic bone tumor is and get a better understanding of what anatomic structures are being affected. There are a variety of tests that can be performed, all of which show us different things. As an orthopedic surgeon, I love x-rays. They are a very simple, quick test that can be done during an office visit. They provide me with a lot of information about the size, location, and impact of that tumor on the bone. Here you can see the yellow arrow pointing to an area of a bone that appears darker than the bone above or below that spot. It has this appearance because there's a tumor in the bone that's begun to destroy and weaken it, causing this patient to have shoulder and arm pain. An MRI can be a very helpful radiology test to help us look at very fine anatomic detail of the bone and surrounding structures. Here is an MRI of a patient with neck pain along with arm pain and weakness. This MRI of the spine helps us to see not only the bone tumor, but also how it's pressing on the spinal cord. When we think about using CT scans to help with the evaluation of bone tumors, it's often best to think of them as a very fancy version of an X-ray. They are excellent tests to help me look at bones. In particular, they're very good for bones that have a somewhat more complicated shape than the mostly straight bones of our arms and legs. For example, here on this X-ray of a pelvis, you can see an arrow pointing to a very subtle dark spot. Because the pelvis is a bone-shaped bowl and holds some of the abdominal organs, it's sometimes difficult to clearly see bone tumors with a plain x-ray. This is a CT scan image of the patient whose x-ray you saw just a minute ago. We can now see that there are even more spots in the bone from this patient's metastatic bone tumor that we weren't able to see with x-ray alone. Bone scans are occasionally performed to help us get a look at the entire skeleton to help identify whether there is just one metastatic bone tumor or several. Now let's dive in and talk about some of the treatment options for metastatic bone tumors. In general, they fall into two categories, surgery and other treatments. As an orthopedic oncologist, my main role in taking care of patients with neuroendocrine tumors is to help treat or prevent broken bones from metastatic tumors with surgery. The type of surgery that we use for these tumors depends a lot on which bone or which part of the skeleton is involved. We use surgery in two situations, treating a bone that has broken because of a metastatic tumor or to prevent a bone with a tumor from breaking. While it's not always possible, our preference is to try to treat bones with metastatic tumors before they break. Regardless of when we perform surgery, I have two main goals. I want to offer the patient a surgery that allows them the quickest recovery possible with the fewest risks, and one that allows them to return to activities as quickly and with as few restrictions as possible. As I mentioned, it's my preference to try to prevent a bone from breaking if at all possible. There are multiple pieces of information that I am able to use to help predict whether or not a bone is at risk for breaking, including the size and location of the tumor, along with how much pain a patient is experiencing. As part of a multidisciplinary treatment team of taking care of patients with metastatic bone tumors, I use information about the risk of a bone breaking along with information from the patient's entire care team to determine the right time for surgery if it's necessary. I want to share with you some examples of the surgeries that can be done for tumors in different bones of the skeleton. This is an x-ray of a patient who had a large tumor in the upper part of the arm bone affecting the shoulder. You can actually see, if you look very closely, that the arm is broken. 
In this situation, the best treatment for this patient was to have the tumor and part of the arm bone removed and replaced with a partial shoulder replacement. This is a patient with a metastatic bone tumor in the spine. One of the challenges here was that the tumor was pressing on the spinal cord, causing pain and weakness. Surgery was performed to remove the tumor. A metal cage was inserted to replace the bone and screws and rods placed in the spine to stabilize it. The patient had a very good outcome with significant improvement in their pain and strength. The hip and thigh are very common locations for us to see metastatic bone tumors. In this case, the patient had a tumor that was destroying the bone on the lower side of the hip bone. Here, the bone had not yet completely broken, and we were able to place this rod and screw to help prevent it from breaking completely. Occasionally, tumors around the hip are treated with complex hip replacements that you can see here on the right side of the screen. Other treatments that can be given for metastatic bone tumors include a variety of medicines such as pain medications or bone strengthening medicines. Less invasive treatments that are performed by our interventional radiology colleagues can also be used. And in many situations, radiation therapy is given to help with pain and treat metastatic bone tumors. Dr. Petroda is going to talk about that in more detail very shortly. In conclusion, the treatment of metastatic bone tumors is always best when we use a team or multidisciplinary approach. With the input of a patient's oncologist, their radiation oncologist, and their orthopedic surgeon, we work together to help improve pain and function for our patients with metastatic bone disease. Thank you. And now, Dr. Petroda. Thank you, Dr. Balak, for the introduction on this presentation, um, including the workup of bone metastases and the surgical management. I'd like to build off of that discussion with information on the role of radiation therapy in the multidisciplinary care of patients who suffer from bone metastases. I have no conflicts to disclose. Over the next several slides, I'd like to discuss four specific elements that pertain directly to the treatment of bone metastases using radiation therapy. First, to reiterate the goals of treatment for bone metastases. Secondly, to discuss the roles of radiation therapy in the treatment of bone metastases. Third, to discuss the available radiation treatment options. And finally, to end with looking ahead to future options for our patients who suffer from bone metastases. First and foremost, to reiterate the goals that Dr. Balak clearly outlined, the goals of radiation and any treatment for bone metastases include, one, pain reduction, two, the preservation of function of the bone, three, maintaining the integrity of the bone itself, four, and importantly, to stop the growth of the tumor, five, to potentially delay the need for systemic therapy for the cancer, and six, potentially to prolong survival in the context of the metastatic cancer. And over the next few slides, we're gonna go into some more detail about what is radiation therapy and how does it work? So what is radiation therapy? Generally, radiation therapy is the delivery of high energy x-rays directed at a tumor location. It's generally thought that radiation therapy kills a cancer by causing irreparable damage to the DNA of the cancer. In fact, more than 50% of cancer patients receive radiation therapy at some point during their treatment course. Radiation can be delivered both as a curative treatment option and palliative in certain situations. And in certain situations, radiation can be used after surgery or instead of surgery. And sometimes radiation is combined with chemotherapy or other systemic agents to synergize with the radiation to make it more impactful. Here is an example of a patient who unfortunately experienced a bone metastasis in the left femur and as a result, the left femur needed to be operated on by our colleagues in orthopedic surgery. And after surgery, the patient required radiation therapy to a large area involving the left femur to minimize the risk for the tumor recurring and causing additional symptoms. So how do we do radiation? Well, 
First and foremost, every radiation plan is personalized to the patient. No radiation plan could be used on more than one patient because it's very precisely tailored to the patient, him or herself. We start with a radiation mapping session, and this is where we create a body mold that holds the patient in place, and we do a scan of the affected area. Once we do the scan, we take into account information from other diagnostic tests, such as an MRI, PET scan, or even bone scans. Putting all that information together, we accurately delineate where the tumor is located and appropriately design a radiation plan. The planning can be as fast as several hours and sometimes requires several days, depending on the complexity of the plan. Radiation is often delivered in between 1 to 10 treatments for bone metastases, and typically we use x-rays or CT scans at the time of treatment to make sure that we're precisely aligned to the tumor area so we can exactly address the tumor but minimize the dose going to other areas of the body. One of the most important parts of radiation is picking the right dose. As you can see on this graph, on the vertical axis, we have the, the ability to control or kill the tumor, ranging from zero to 100%. On the horizontal axis, we've got the radiation dose, ranging from a low dose on the left side to a high dose on the right side. And depending on the type of tumor, we know that the, the dose delivered to the tumor directly impacts the ability to control the tumor, where a high dose would be more likely to kill the tumor and control it, where a low dose may be less likely, but may still improve pain. So we generally think of a low dose as being palliative or low enough to not cause a lot of symptoms, but enough to improve pain, whereas a high dose would be more likely to control the tumor long term. How do we pick the right dose for a given patient? Here are some examples of a palliative low dose approach on the left versus a ablative or high dose approach on the right. And this is a patient that had a painful bone metastasis in the lower part of the spine. And what you can see is by contrast to the, the low dose palliative treatment on the left, the right side, the ablative high dose is a more complex plan and treats a more limited area compared to the palliative regimen, which is covering a broader area. And there are pros and cons to each of these approaches. And on the next slide, I'll go through a comparison of the palliative low dose regimens versus the higher dose ablative regimens and how we select the most appropriate treatment option for a given patient. So in comparison, the palliative doses are easy to plan. They're very fast and very quick to generate a treatment plan rapidly. By contrast, the ablative or high doses are slower to plan and more complex. In terms of targeting the tumor, typically palliative doses are less precise. They can cover a broader area, which may have benefits in certain situations, whereas the ablative or high doses are highly precise and best suited for smaller tumors. When a patient actually needs to be treated, the treatment delivery is vastly different between the two. For the palliative doses, it's pretty quick, about 10 or 20 minutes for a given treatment. Whereas for a higher dose, because there's more complexity involved, it can take between 30 to 45 minutes to deliver a, a given treatment. Pain responses seem to be quite good in both situations, with 60 to 80% of patients receiving a pain benefit in the, the lower dose arm, but the palliative doses can often take a bit more time to experience a pain relief. By contrast, with the higher doses, the pain response tends to be a bit better, and it tends to be more durable. However, the, the downside is that sometimes the pain can get a little worse before it gets better. That being said, both regimens are well tolerated, but the ability to control the tumor long term appears to be more durable with a higher dose. And there may be a benefit in terms of improving survival with the higher dose than the lower doses, but taken together, we have to think about all of the different factors that need to be considered when choosing the right radiation regimen. So how do we pick the best dose for a given patient? How do we personalize a treatment? Well, we think about the type of cancer. Is it resistant or sensitive to radiation? How long do we expect that we would need to be controlling the tumor? What's the life expectancy of a given patient? Importantly, how tolerable is the treatment itself for the patient? Can a patient lay flat for upwards of 10, 20 minutes if needed? Also, what are all the available treatment options 
both localized and systemic. Importantly, how urgent is the treatment needed? Is the pain so unbearable that we need to get treated right away? Or do we have a bit more time to come up with a more complex plan? Also, what's the health of the bone? Is it at risk for fracture or is it healthy? And is the tumor taking up a very small part of the bone? In addition, is the lesion located next to another area of the body that is very sensitive to treatment that we need to be very mindful of and protect with all our efforts? And finally, has the area been previously radiated? That definitely is an important factor that we need to account for when designing any radiation plan. Looking ahead, it's always important to note that a team approach is always going to win. And we have a fantastic team of orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, interventional radiologists, anesthesiologists, radiation oncologists, and medical oncologists who put their heads together to come up with the best personalized plan for each patient. We personalize it from the perspective of local treatment options as well as systemic options. And finally, What we're seeing today is that there are a number of advances in the field of of oncology. And so with that, I thank you for the opportunity to present to you today and about this topic that we're very passionate about. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patricia Daya. I'm an MD-PhD and a professor in the Department of Medicine, a distinguished chair in oncology at the Department of Medicine, Division of Oncology, University of Texas Health, San Antonio. This work started uh, as a partnership with uh, Dr. Alice Sorani at UCLA. Uh, We uh, felt that we could develop an innovative way to study a few chromocytomas and paragangliomas by creating a new model of uh, mini organoids. So organoids are uh, mini uh, structures that try to copy the tumor um, on a on a a petri dish or a plate, uh, so that we could study them. Uh, straight from a uh, patient cells. So, uh, so the study involves creating these models, studying these models um, as they grow, and uh, testing them in, in a variety of ways where we can really understand how the tumors develop, uh, what type of cells are important for the tumor, what makes them aggressive sometimes or not, and, and also importantly, how certain drugs can be used potentially to treat them. This is a unique model because it it tries to mimic or to copy exactly what is happening in the tumor cells in a plate. So this has not been done in pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas yet. It has been done for other tumors, more common types, but not for this particular tumor. So we're trying to develop and refine a model that can eventually be expanded to other cases and other patients and other labs So it would be uh, an important resource for uh, other researchers in the field. Rare tumors, uh, and especially neuroendocrine tumors, they have very few available models for studying that reflect the actual human tumor. So uh, models that will uh, develop uh, in, in this area will benefit patients and can provide uh, precision medicine opportunities. So we can treat the the tumors based on their genetic profile and their genetic unique properties. So we're we're excited that this this project can also illuminate uh, information on, on unique aspects of individual patients. So the possibility of creating this model where we can observe and manipulate in a way that can give us answers to so many questions that we've had for for decades is very exciting. We are very fortunate to have been selected for uh, developing this this preliminary work, this initial uh, idea and uh, with the hopes that this is going to be become something of uh, a broader resource in the future. So we're, we're incredibly 
grateful for, for the funding. Um, it, it's not common for uh, rare cancers to be uh, selected uh, for funding. So this is a unique opportunity for us to develop this, this model. The progresses that we make here will have an impact uh, beyond sometimes these particular tumors and into other neuroendocrine tumors beyond pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas because uh, these, these models can, can potentially serve as a screen. So we're very lucky to have, uh, uh, to be able to count with the generosity uh, of the donors in this, in this project. And uh, we're, we're certainly grateful for any advances that we can make that will improve patients' lives. Now please welcome University of California, San Francisco nurse practitioner, Kathleen Cavanaugh, to explore integrative medicine for neuroendocrine cancer with strategies for your mind, body, and soul. She works at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine and completed a fellowship at the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. This is another topic that was very popular in our survey to identify conference topics. Thank you for that introduction um, and for having me today. My name is Kathleen Cavanaugh and I'm a nurse practitioner in integrative oncology at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. And I'm going to give a brief overview on integrative oncology and talk a little bit more in detail about acupuncture, cannabis and mind body modalities. So, Integrative medicine use in cancer, we know that upwards of 90% of people diagnosed with cancer utilize different forms of integrative interventions. And less than half of them discuss this with their oncologist, which is concerning and something that I would encourage you to do more is to bring forward what you are considering and what you are using. A major predictive factor of whether or not people are going to use integrative modalities is social support. Expectations around what they're getting out of it is increased longevity or that it might cure their cancer. And these expectations are more so if there is family endorsement for use. So a definition of integrative oncology is it's a patient-centered, evidence-informed field that utilizes these modalities alongside conventional cancer treatments. And I've underscored two words, alongside. The goal here is that you're using these interventions in conjunction with your conventional cancer treatment, not as opposed to or forgoing any conventional treatment and evidence-informed rather than evidence-based. And we use evidence-informed because in integrative oncology, we often don't have the same level of evidence that some of the prescription medications have, but look at the safety of the intervention and use that to guide your decision of how much evidence you need. I always say that an integrative approach is like a wheel and you wanna to try to put as many spokes in that wheel as you possibly can. So it highlights that there is many things that you can be doing and that it's not really just about one intervention. You wanna look at all aspects of self, so what you're going to do for your body, mind, and spirit. And one challenge that I like to give people is to think about what you're gonna do for your mind and spirit. Or another way to frame it is, what can you do for your heart and your soul, um, not just always focusing on the physical aspects. The National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health has outlined five domains of complementary and alternative medicine. So there are manipulative and body-based methods such as massage, mind-body medicine, such as mindfulness, hypnosis, meditation. There are alternative medical systems like traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy, naturopath. There are energy-based therapies such as acupuncture, also Reiki, healing touch, and then the biologically-based therapies like diet and supplements. 
the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research, the largest organizations doing work on diet and lifestyle for the prevention of cancer. But as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, after a cancer diagnosis, it's recommended that you continue to follow these above guidelines. And going up on the left-hand side, it is about maintaining a healthy weight, being physically active, eating a plant-based diet, and reducing processed fast foods, red and processed meats, sugary drink, and alcohol, and not using supplements for preventing cancer. So a quick word on the gut microbiome. This area of science is this understanding that our digestive tracts are compromised of trillions of microbes and bacteria. And in cancer, what we're learning is the more diversity of healthy gut bacteria you have, the better your immune system, also the better your mental health. And in order to get a wider array of this healthy gut bacteria, you want to be eating a fiber rich diet which is where the guidelines for an anti-inflammatory plant-based whole food diet comes from. Um, so it's these high fiber plant-based foods which feed the healthy gut bacteria. The plate here on the right is the challenge to try to get more plant-based sources of protein in addition to your fruits, vegetables, and whole grains as your digestive tract tolerates it and to primarily stick with food sources, not using supplements, which are not as effective and often not absorbed as well. And just a quick word, this article really highlights that visceral obes obesity and metabolic syndrome are risk factors for neuroendocrine tumors. Metabolic syndrome is defined as having all three of these bullet points but any one of these factors, whether it be elevated waist circumference, fasting, blood glucose levels, triglycerides, insulin issues are risk factors and diet is an intervention to help reduce this. In addition, an intervention is exercise. And this comes from the American College for Sports Medicine. You can actually download this PDF from their website and it gives several different specific guidelines for aerobic and strength training exercises for different symptoms that can come up in cancer and cancer survival. And at the top, it's basically saying that you need to hit a minimum of 150 minutes a week of that aerobic activity and strength training at least twice a week. Another thing you could consider is bringing in mindfulness to your eating. And this paper here outlined and concluded that the practice of mindful eating helped with reduction in food cravings, portion control, body mass index, and body weight. So a little bit on acupuncture in cancer care. We know that people with cancer tend to use acupuncture more as compared to those without cancer. In 2017, almost 90% of NCI designated cancer centers um, were offering acupuncture. And it is recommended in the SIO and ASCO guidelines for breast cancer treatment. And the SIO, which is the Society for Integrative Oncology, looked at evidence for acupuncture and symptom management and found strong recommendations for its use in the symptoms listed below. Another recent study done at a hospital system in Ohio, where they looked at inpatient, outpatient acupuncture programs, um, an employee group acupuncture program, and they also looked at utilizing a sliding scale payment model because one of the barriers with acupuncture is cost. In the outpatient assessment, they used the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale, and they gave the survey before and after each weekly session. It's a scale of zero to 10, where you rate your different symptoms, and a change of one was considered to be statistically significant. And what they found, again, in outpatient pre and post acupuncture sessions, before is blue and after is green and across the board with all symptoms there was a statistically significant reduction the two that were most reduced were pain and neuropathy 
So for acupuncture in cancer, we know that it improves symptoms of chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting and likely nausea and vomiting that comes about from any treatment. It is effective in reducing insomnia. There are new studies emerging that it can be helpful in reducing neuropathy and it definitely helps with pain reduction. So a little bit on cannabis. The cannabinoid receptors, CBD1 and CBD2, can modulate some camp cancer symptoms. And CBD1 and CBD2 are targeted by cannabis. Opioid and cannabinoid receptors have overlapping neuroanatomical receptor distribution. And they have looked at the use of concurrent opioids and cannabis. And in the HIV AIDS research, there was no um, safety concerns in that it did not raise blood levels of opioids and the people using the cannabis in conjunction with the opioids needed less of them. And cannabis-based medicines, not only can they help chronic pain, but they tend to have a favorable safety profile compared to the opioids. Of what we know, CBD has anti-inflammatory effects and THC, which is the psychoactive component, um, is very good for mood and sleep. Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoid, which is the main active cannabinoid in the plant, has been FDA approved and available in a prescription medication for several years. One of my mentors always says that cannabis is a single intervention that can assist with a multitude of symptoms and that it certainly is of value and can be added to other treatments. Many do advise against inhaling, um, although the evidence for serious harm is pretty scant. If you live in a state where you have a variety of other methods available, you can explore other routes, mostly oral. But there is also topical, and in this study, they looked at topical CBD uh, oil for peripheral neuropathy, and applying the CBD oil daily for four weeks statistically reduced intensity of pain, sharp neuropathic pain, and cold and itching sensations in the CBD group compared to the placebo group. So topical is another route to consider. And then as far as dosing, this paper was a consensus-based dosing recommendation paper. And globally, they got together healthcare professionals from a variety of different backgrounds, including oncology and pain. And the recommendations were, especially if you're naive to cannabis, to start with a five milligram oral dose of a CBD predominant product and to begin it once or twice a day. And then you can increase that by 10 milligrams every two to three days to about a max dose of 40 milligrams or to your desired effect. If needed, you can add in THC, but to start at a very low dose of 2.5 milligrams and then increase that maybe once, if not twice a week to a max dose of about 40 milligrams. So this is a great paper giving some guidance on how to begin with dosing. And then just a few words on the emotional and mental components that come up with a cancer diagnosis, ongoing symptoms, treatment, and living with a chronic condition. And how do you help with that? Well, this is where the mind-body modalities come into play. Here is a list of some examples of things that you can do to intervene and help you with your coping. Um, this list is not exhaustive, but just examples. And Dr. Richard Davison from the University of Wisconsin has done a lot of work on understanding what happens in our brain when you utilize mind-body modalities such as meditation. And he has come up with the four components of emotional well-being, awareness, insight, purpose, and connection. And these are aspects that can be manipulated. So you can improve all these aspects by practicing mind-body modalities. And if you're interested in a resource, the Healthy Minds app is 100% free. You can download it on your phone and it gives you a little tutorial and then a guided meditation which will improve all of these aspects of emotional well-being. 
And then when you use mind body modalities, what you're really doing is cultivating resiliency. And this is one of my favorite quotes. It's not the load that breaks you down. It's the way you carry it. So what this is really saying is that it's, it's not the stress, it's how you cope with it. Um, we don't have a lot of control over stress. What we do have control over is how you cope with it. And if you practice mind body modalities, you will cultivate resiliency to stress. So in conclusion, if for nothing else, integrative oncology will help to increase a sense of control over something that you don't have a lot of control over. For the most part, you can try to control your weight. Um, you can certainly alter your diet, increase physical activity, um, use supplements appropriately and safely, become aware of your breath and your breathing, which is free and always with you. Consider guided imagery or other forms of meditation and relaxation. Connect with family and friends, and then also engage in spirituality and religious practices. So thank you for your time and attention, and I hope you found this of benefit. Registered dietitian and private consultant Leanne Burns joins us now to discuss net nutrition and supplements. Leanne Burns has practiced nutrition and dietetics for 30 years, including many years at LSU Medical School Oncology. Good afternoon. This is Leanne Burns, and I am a consulting nutritionist uh, with over 25 years of experience uh, with working with patients with neuroendocrine tumors and their nutritional needs. Today, I had the privilege of uh, working, uh, presenting today um, information related to nutrition and supplements. Today, I hope to be able to give you a basic overview of what nutrition supplements are and uh, what we mean by nutrition supplements. Uh, go through some of the current research that we do have available to us um, and, and exciting uh, information uh, related to neuroendocrine tumors, cancer patients, and neuro, uh, nutrition supplements. And also, uh, uh, during this time, we'll also discuss some of the standard uses and how to be work with monitoring uh, nutrition supplement uses. So what do we mean by nutritional supplements? There's three basic types when, uh, today that I'm going to, that I put these into categories. Um, we're going to start with oral nutrition supplements. These are very important and they contain 100% of a patient's uh, nutritional needs to be considered an oral nutritional supplement. It has to be complete. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk a little bit about vitamins and minerals. This is usually an area that people are very interested in and also uh, cover basic, um, what's now considered biological based complementary alternative medicine, which is also um, used widely uh, among uh, cancer patients and neuroendocrine tumor patients as well. So what is oral nutrition supplements? This is a commercial product that has uh, uh, can come in many forms, liquid form and powder forms are the most common. They must have complete macronutrients and micronutrients within the product. And what it's used for is to increase the oral intake overall for patient that may need it. It contains vitamins and minerals as well as trace elements. And these are all are monitored uh, to assure that its labels match what's contained. It is set up so that it's nutritionally balanced for 1500 calorie needs as their standard. These can become in different areas. Um, sometimes they uh, are meal replacements and um, they can also vary according to the amount of calories and the calorie density um, that they contain. They also can have special needs such as uses in uh, diabetics, patients with COPD, kidney disease, liver disease often have to have a specialty product which will have differences in the components of the protein types, carbohydrate types, and the fat types that are contained in these products. We use them in uh, patients that have high stress levels or high protein needs as well. It also has their specialty products in the same area of complete oral nutrition uh, supplements that's very helpful in neuroendocrine tumors because of their help with malabsorption and GI problems. These are usually partially elemental or partially broken down, we speak about. And the research that we have available at this time shows that this is achieved with the use of oral nutritional supplements widely. Um, the research is pretty good in those areas. There's also some research that has used specific ingredients such as the fish oil to show that 
It um, reduced the inflammatory effect uh, overall. And sometimes uh, neuroendocrine patients do not uh, do well with just the standard formulas that we use in other patients. They actually need a specialty product or something that may even have an MCT oil for their fat sources uh, for patients with GI disturbances such as diarrhea and fat malabsorption. And then we have products that are not really nutritionally complete, but they're very useful. Um, these can be protein powders. Often they're amino acids. We also have products that's being researched heavily and I'm really excited about. And it has shown some improvement in overall care. It actually is also used in oncology overall and accepted uh, and discussed even in the oncology in the clinical journal. Um, next, we can talk about the biologically based complementary medicines. And this includes some of the uh, vitamins as well. I had vitamins in a different category, but this really overall was looked at and to include vitamins and minerals. What we found in some uh, recent studies showed that 66% overall use, um, 42% used um, two or more, and uh, it's most common among women. It, it has been associated with some dietary intake and, it, and improvement in the uh, ECOG uh, performance. So there are some encouragements with this. Uh, the problem is with a study where um, it was self-reported uh, and they're not well defined about what was a vitamin so these only need to be used under guidance of a uh, primary care physician or uh, practice provider and uh, really your oncologist. It's not recommended during chemotherapy as far as the uh, alternative medicines that have not been outside of vitamins and minerals uh, that have been used, uh, prescribed by your physicians or discussed with your physicians and as part of your care plan. We do know that some of these um, herbal treatments do cause some interference during chemotherapies. And one example of these in the neuroendocrine area is Afinitor and St. John Wort. In the study that I discussed a minute ago, um, you can see here uh, a little bit um, of what was found as far as um, vitamins. But we talked a little bit about the overall CAM at 61%, um, 52% take more than two forms. In this study, uh, vitamin and mineral overall use was 47%. Most often it was calcium and vitamin D and the fat soluble vitamins are something that we do co are concerned with. Uh, some of the non-vitamin mineral overall use was 33% and these can uh, vary between fish oil, which was the most popular overall, and then so, all the way down from herbs, ginseng, uh, garlic, and I'll actually broke probiotics was included in this as well, which um, I think was interesting. The vitamins is very common among cancer patients to have vitamin deficiencies. Fat soluble vitamin deficiencies have been found in neuroendocrine tumor patients. We know and often hear about niacin. Fat soluble vitamins are stored in the body. So we have more of a concern with overuse and toxicities in this group even though we see a high amount of fat soluble vitamin deficiencies. And this has been studied quite well over the years uh, with oncology patients and these levels of vitamin D. All vitamins um, need to be um, actually checked by test results to identify that they have deficiencies and not be used without guidance and without monitoring because we have interferences sometimes with medications and actually the toxicities in fat soluble vitamins can be detrimental. So we want to make sure we have a, a good plan. So the most common mineral that's used is calcium. Uh, we also see uh, use of phosphorus uh, because of bone health concerns. Potassium in some areas of diarrhea uh, can be a concern, both highs, uh, but we don't want to get lows. We want to never use potassium without monitoring due to concerns of uh, toxicities. High levels can cause heart attacks, actually. Uh, magnesiums uh, and high mats can cause diarrhea as well. So we want to monitor all these, make sure that we know what your levels are before use and make sure that we always use uh, control and monitoring um, and as part of your care plan. In summary, nutritional supports are used widely among oncology patients. Oral nutritional supplements are found to increase intakes of nutrients overall and uh, are beneficial that we feel comfortable with research uh, to continue this and to learn more. But at this point, uh, we want to encourage uh, specialty use of nutritional supplements so that they meet the needs of neuroendocrine tumors. And remember, it's not all of them are going to meet the needs if you have malabsorption. So um, levels uh, should be monitored and adjusted on a regular basis. Some of these nutrients actually can increase the performance status. We want to monitor this very well. We do have concerns always with interferences uh, and treatments and use of CAM. 
And in conclusion, um, it's always important that we have a conversation between patients and providers when we're using uh, nutrition supplements, uh, whether it be oral nutritional supplements that are controlled and we know what's in these products. We know that there's a big deficit in some of the information in some of the herbal areas. So even things that can be beneficial can be problematic when is taken in larger amounts than what is recommended. So um, a basic understanding and use of nutrition supplements are very helpful for both providers and patients. And remembering that it's not a one size fits all. And we also want to provide reliable sources of information related to nutritional supplements and avoid the use without medical advice. Follow the research, be uh, aware of that we're in a time when more research is coming out in nutrition and nets all the time. I hope to be a part of this as uh, my team uh, internationally, which is uh, going to give more advice and more exact advice uh, that may answer some more of your questions in this area. Uh, and again, make sure that we um, as a, include everything as a medical team and work together as practitioners and with our patients and uh, follow standards of practice uh, is very important in the areas of oncology overall. I want to thank you for having me today. Uh, and uh, you can refer any questions to Cancer Nutrition Care if you would like to get in touch with me later. And uh, I hope this was beneficial. Thank you. Now we're going to turn our attention to research in our next two talks. Dr. Eric Nakakura, an oncology surgeon with the University of California, San Francisco, highlights some of the latest trends in basic and translational net research. Dr. Nakakura's research activity and surgical practice are focused on neuroendocrine tumors, and he is a past NetRF grantee. Thank you very much, Elise. Hi, my name is Eric Nakakura, and I'm a surgical oncologist at the University of California, San Francisco. Today, I'm excited to provide an overview of trends in basic and translational NET research. I've received funding from the NetRF to support my research. When I was preparing for this talk, I just attended the NetRF Annual Research Symposium. This is one meeting I really look forward to each year. The reason is that the NetRF Annual Research Symposium features state-of-the-art net research conducted by the who's who in the field. Simply put, this is where you go if you want to see what cutting-edge net research is being done by the best investigators in the world today. So for an overview of trends in basic and translational net research, Look no further than the NetRF Annual Research Symposium. Today, I want to summarize some of the themes in basic and translational net research that emerged from the meeting. The three main themes were net models, net biology, and net imaging and therapies. A big part of the symposium focused on the development of new net models. So what is a net model, and why are so many net researchers working so hard to make them? I want to tell you a brief story about how critically important models are. Several years ago, a patient of mine was diagnosed with a rare type of pancreas cancer. In fact, it was the same type of pancreas cancer that Steve Jobs had called a neuroendocrine tumor. This patient's name was Larry, and Larry was an engineer, and he wanted to know everything about his disease. You know, what caused it, what made it grow, and how to treat it. At the time, we really didn't have satisfactory answers to any of the basic yet critical questions about the disease he had. Larry and I were frustrated. And as any good engineer would do, Larry asked why. Why didn't we know what caused it? Why didn't we know what made it grow? And why didn't we have any drugs to treat it? Then Larry made the critical observation. Engineers use model systems to understand complex processes. He rationalized that if we had a model system of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we could test new drugs to see if they worked. The problem, I told Larry, was that there were no models for his disease. So what do you do if there are no models? Well, you make your own. And that's exactly what Larry and I decided to do. With the generous support from the NetRF, we made the world's first bona fide model of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. With this model, we found that a new drug stop the growth of tumors when other treatments stopped working. This led to a clinical trial enrolling patients from over 400 study locations throughout the United States. The results are pending and there's much hope and excitement that this new drug will be used in patients. So net models are very important to study the causes of nets, their biology, and to test new therapies. 
models are incredibly important. And this is reflected by the many talks on net models at the symposium. Another huge part of the symposium focused on the biology of nets. So what is the biology of nets and why is it so important? To understand the biology is to understand what makes nets tick. It is to know what causes nets to form, what makes them grow and spread, and what drugs might work. A complete understanding of net biology is like the repair manual for your car. When something goes wrong, mechanics know what it is and how to fix it. Finally, a large part of the symposium was dedicated to imaging and therapies. Better imaging will allow us to better detect and evaluate the extent of disease. Importantly, we desperately need more effective therapies for NETs. And the holy grail of NET therapy is to attack the disease and not cause any side effects. I would like to highlight one such effort presented at the symposium. Investigators are working on using a strategy called CAR T cells, which uses the immune system to target the cancer. This approach has been very successful for other forms of cancers called lymphoma. So there's much hope that it can be applied to other cancers such as NETs. I hope I convince you that the future is bright for NET research. There are many exciting developments and we hope they will make it way to patients very soon. Thank you very much for your attention. Our research discussion continues with what's new in NET clinical trials from Dr. Jadira Del Rivero, an endocrine oncologist at the Developmental Therapeutics Branch of the National Cancer Institute, National Institutes of Health. If you are interested in clinical trials, be sure to discuss this with your physician and care team. After Dr. Del Rivero's talk, please stay tuned for the live Q&A session. Thank you so much, Elise, for the introduction. My name is Haidira Del Rivero, and I am a medical oncologist at the National Cancer Institute, National Institute of Health. First, let's discuss what are clinical trials. Clinical trials are research studies that test how well new medical approaches work in people. The goal is to determine the safety and efficacy of a study drug. In terms of the clinical trials, we have different phases. Phase one is to determine the safety of the drug. Phase two is to determine what is the efficacy of the drug and also determine more safety as well. Phase three is when we compare drug with what we know, what is the standard of care options, and that would then lead to the approval of that drug that we're studying. Now let's discuss what are the clinical trials. A few of the clinical trials are well available for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. First, let's discuss the nether twist study. The nether twist study is a phase three study to evaluate the efficacy and safety of Luthathera in patients with grade two and grade three advanced gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. The aim of the study is to determine if Luthathera in combination with octreotide, 30 milligrams, can be given as a first-line treatment in patients with higher grade neuroendocrine tumors. And that is when comparing with high-dose octreotide. The primary endpoint is survival without progression of disease. And the secondary endpoint of the study is to determine if this treatment can shrink the tumors as well as the quality of life and also to determine if this treatment can help the patients live longer with the disease. Now, let's discuss about the COMPETE study. The COMPETE study is a phase three study of efficacy and safety of 177 lutetian edotriotide in patients with gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. The aim of the study is to determine if PRRT can be given before everolimus. The primary endpoint of the study is the survival without progression of disease. The secondary endpoint is to determine if this treatment, when it's given prior everolimus, could then decrease or shrink the tumors, and also to determine if these patients can live longer with the disease. The inclusion criteria is patients that have somatostatin receptor positive gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. The next study that I would like to discuss is the NETRP study. P is for pediatric. This study is a phase two to evaluate the efficacy and dosimetry, and what that means dosimetry is also to determine the measurement and assessment of the quantity of 
quality of this type of radiation in adolescent patients with somatostatin receptor positive gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. The primary endpoint of the study, as we discussed earlier, is to determine what is the quantitative quality of giving this type of treatment in pediatric populations from ages 12 to 18. Another important point about this study is that besides gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, this study is also able to treat patients with metastatic or advanced pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. The next study that I would like to discuss today or mention today is the phase two study of 177 nutrition day in patients with somatostatin receptor positive advanced bronchial neuroendocrine tumors. Dr. Pada discussed this study earlier today in her presentation. The next I would like to discuss is about PRT in combination with DNA repair inhibitors. And these studies are followed very closely. So what does that mean? So PRT is a type of radiation. And when radiation is given to the tumor cell, it causes damage to the DNA of the tumor cell. And what the tumor cell is going to do is going to try to repair itself by activating protein or enzymes. These DNA repair inhibitors, what they're going to do is block those enzymes of those proteins, and the hypothesis is it can make Luthathera more effective. There are three ongoing clinical studies of a PRT treatment uh, with Luthathera in combination with DNA repair inhibitors, and we're going to mention two of them very briefly. The first one is the phase one study. As we discussed earlier, the phase one study is to determine the safety of triapine, which is a DNA repair inhibitor in combination with Luthathera. Once the maximum tolerated dose and the safe dose is established on the phase one study, then it will move to the phase two study. The PI of the study is Dr. Amon Shahan. Now, I would like to discuss another phase one to study of Luthathera in combination with Olaparib, and I'm very fortunate to lead this effort together with Dr. Franklin, who is the PI of the study. Uh, phase one study, I will discuss earlier, is to determine the safety profile, and once we determine the maximum tolerated dose, then we can move to the phase two study. And the phase two study is also determined as well what is the efficacy of the drug in terms if this combination can shrink the tumors. Now, let's discuss another study of importance, and this is a phase one study of uh, dot -tam -t, and this is what we call alpha emitters. Earlier today, you heard about the difference between beta emitters, which is Luthathera, and alpha emitters. Uh, this study is led by Dr. Dalpa Sand. And the primary endpoint of the study, since this is a phase study to determine the safety, is to determine what is the maximum tolerated dose to then move to the phase two study. The secondary endpoint of the study is to determine if the tumors can shrink with this treatment. Now, let's discuss about another study, and this is the cabinet study. The uh, PI of this study is Dr. Jennifer Chin. Cabosantinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and this type of drug, what it does, it, it blocks the blood supply going into the tumor. Uh, this study is for advanced pancreas and small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. This is a registry study, meaning that this, the results are positive for this study. This can lead to the approval to give cabosantinib for pancreas and as well as small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. This is a randomized study with placebo. However, if the patient has progression of disease with placebo, then can receive open-label cabosantinib. The primary endpoint of the study is to determine uh, time to tumor growth, and secondary endpoint of the studies is to determine response rate, meaning the tumors can shrink with this treatment, as well as if the patients can live longer with the disease. Now, let's discuss a few clinical trials for patients with poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. The first one that I would like to discuss is this uh, drug, which is a DNA repair inhibitor, as we discussed earlier with PRRT, which damaged the DNA. Chemotherapy can also damage the DNA, and by, by giving it with another DNA repair inhibitor, could this enhance the efficacy of the chemotherapy? This is in combination either with the renotecan or topotecan. This is currently on a phase one study, and once they determine the PI determined what is the maximum tolerated dose for the phase two, then the PI would then have expansion cohorts for small cell lung carcinoma, as well as for poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. The PI of the study is Dr. Satya Das at Vanderbilt Cancer Center. 
Now I'm going to discuss another study, which is cabosantinib. Uh, cabosantinib, we discussed earlier, is a tyrosine kinase, and this type of drug block the blood supply going into the tumor in combination with immunotherapy, nivolumab and epilimumab. And the aim of the study is to determine by giving cabosantinib with immunotherapy, could this enhance efficacy? After a few cycles, epilimumab will be dropped and the patient will continue with cabosantinib and nivolumab. Uh, the primary endpoint of the study is to determine if this treatment or combination treatment can shrink the tumors. And secondary endpoint of the study is to determine survival without progression of disease, as well as how long is the duration of response. Lastly, I'm going to discuss the study, which is a phase one to a study. Phase one is to determine the safety of the drug, and once we determine what is the maximum tolerated dose, then it will be moved to a phase two study of lorvinectidin, which is a type of chemotherapy with versus assertive, which is another DNA repair inhibitor. I'm also very fortunate to work with Dr. Anish Thomas, who is the PI of the studies, enrolling patients with high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. Once we establish the phase two dose, the goal of the study is to determine what is the efficacy of the combination treatment in patients with high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. With that, I finish my presentation. I thank you all for your attention, and also I would like to thank all of the principal investigators of the studies who allow me to present their work today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mm. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Leanne. So Leanne Burns is a retiree from um, LSU New Orleans. Uh, she's now in private practice and she's a nutritionist and uh, dietitian. Uh, we have Dr. Helen T here, uh, who is a hepatologist at the University of Chicago. We have uh, Dr. Jadira Del Rivero, who is a uh, medical oncologist at the National Institutes of Health. We have Dr. Um, Tessa Balak, who is a um, orthopedic surgeon uh, at the University of Chicago. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Um, Eric Nakakura, who is a surgical oncologist at UCSF. So welcome all of you. Um, I'm really excited to have you here for the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes. We'll answer some more questions that were um, asked by our patients uh, throughout the day and that uh, specifically related uh, or relate to the topics that you have talked about uh, uh, throughout the day. So let's go right into this. Um, let's start with uh, Dr. Balak. So we have a, a question about uh, which modality, surgery versus uh, radiation oncology, is preferred for bone disease that is uh, symptomatic? It's a great question and, and one that I spend a lot of time talking with my patients about. They're, they're really two separate treatments used for different reasons, although used complementary in, in many situations. We think of radiation um, being applied uh, two bone tumors from neuroendocrine tumors that are painful. Uh, we use the radiation to sort of attack that tumor that's growing in the bone. Radiation though, on the other hand, doesn't help the structure or the strength of the bone. And sometimes bone tumors can eat away at the bone so much that it puts them at risk for breaking. And that's where surgery comes in. Our goal with surgery is to help with pain that's coming from the bone getting weak. So it reinforces the structure of the bone. Um, and certainly if the bone is broken, we often have to do surgery a lot of times. So really the goal of surgery is to help with the, the strength and the, like the physical structure of the bone where radiation helps us actually uh, kill the tumor cells that are growing in the bone. So they, we often use them together, but that's how I like to think of them in two separate categories. Great. Uh, is there a certain um, strategy that you use to, where you tell your patients, should we do surgery first versus radiation first? What should come first? So meaning if you've had a tumor uh, that was um, operated on and it came back, can you still radiate it or vice versa? If you've had a bone tumor that was radiated, can you still do an operation on it? Yes. Yes to both of those things. So oftentimes um, when we think about using surgery to treat a bone tumor, um, we do the surgery and then, and then coordinate with our radiation colleagues to do radiation right after surgery to treat that. So it gets kind of a one-two punch, both surgery for the structure and then radiation to 
um, to treat the tumor. Sometimes even after radiation, that tumor can continue to grow in the bone. And then the structure part is, is what we have to take care of. And we can easily do surgery, even if radiation has always been done. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, one more question that we had related to bone disease, and I don't know, uh, like Dr. Balak, if you could uh, answer that, but the question that was asked was, um, uh, does uh, like aspirin and um, other um, NSAIDs help um, against bone disease? So how do you manage the pain in and around surgery and um, after surgery when it comes to uh, bone metastases? So we use a, a number of different pain medications in and around surgery. So maybe even before surgery and bone metastases that are painful, we can use things like Tylenol at times, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, and then we get into stronger pain medications if we need to. And all of that is really tailored to each patient based on the degree of pain, what systemic therapy they're on, because sometimes they're on treatments that make us pull back or want to use a different medication um, preferentially. So it, it is something that's tailored, but we have a nice big uh, selection of, of medicines to pick from to help treat pain. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Let's move on to uh, Dr. Nakakura. Um, there's a question here about a patient that was asking, do, uh, does diabetes increase um, after surgery for a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor? Um, especially if you only remove the tail of the pancreas? Uh, that's a good question. I'd say in general, if you're just removing a part of the pancreas, whether it's the left side of the pancreas or the right side of the pancreas, most patients do not become diabetic. Um, there are some folks that are on the fence, like they're carefully watching their diet. Um, they, they're sort of borderline diabetic. You know, in that situation, you know, surgery may tip, tip them over the edge. But in general, Taking out a neuronic tumor in the pancreas does not make someone diabetic. Great. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to Leanne. So there's a question here, Leanne, um, about uh, nutrition. There's actually a couple of them. Um, so one patient is asking, um, let me see, I got to put it. Can food triggers um, ever go away with any particular treatment? So is your experience that as patients that have food triggers and get treated over time, do they actually tend to get better or, or does that sort of stay the same over time? No, um, if, a, um, if a treatment such as a surgery or um, a PRT actually has decreased the tumor uh, over expression of hormones um, and the tumor bulk, many times we can reset that and kind of reset their their symptoms uh, as well. So, um, so yes, it can change during uh, treatment times, depending on what's uh, the overexpression or the expression of hormones from the tumor. So that is, uh, we do see that. And sometimes um, when we work with a diet and we alter things that uh, the body can adjust to certain foods that they might not have tolerated over time. And we see that uh, sometimes even with uh, just symptomatic things like gas and, and irritability as well. So we just kind of take everything down and start again and, and, and just work a diet up. But yes, it can change. That's the answer. Sometimes it sure can change. Great. And there were um, at least one or two questions about uh, sugars. In your experience, Leanne, does it matter if you eat a lot of sugar, does that trigger symptoms or even worse, are these actually sugar-driven tumors? So do you tell your patients to stay away from sugars because you know, the tumors could grow more rapidly. Now, I don't tell them that because it can make them grow rap uh, more rapidly because I don't think we've got that um, proven in neuroendocrine in, in research yet. But right. what it does is increase the motility of uh, the GI tract. We see that often behind Whipple's and um, gastric surgeries for sure, also with the small bowel surgeries. So the concentration and the osmolality, this is going to cause what we used to kind of in uh, gastric, we said, call it a dumping syndrome, but a real rapid uh, uh, emptying of the GI tract, and that's going to increase symptoms. Also, um, one of the symptoms um, that's real common is fatigue. And, and when you drink concentrated sweets, it's going to make, even in a normal patient, will make that blood triggers, uh, blood sugars go up higher than normal. Um, they're going to fall faster from the insulin release, and it increases fatigue syndrome. So one of the things that we, you know, the, the high loads of sugar can, um, can also play a part with that as well. 
Um, and, and we may see some other reasons, for, uh, but we usually, when you're looking at the label, when we talk about concentrated sweets, we try to keep that on the label 12, kind of as the magic number. So we try to keep the sugars um, down below 12, 12 or less. Great. So as usual, a fine balance is what the, what the human body needs. Um, fantastic. So uh, let's move on to the next question. This is a question for Dr. T. Um, what about liver transplant in nets? Um, what's your experience with it? Is, should we use it frequently? Um, any uh, comments about that? Uh, as, as we all know, liver transplants are pretty big um, processes to go through and, and availability of uh, donors is not necessarily so widespread. So we do tailor the liver transplant indication to the patients who will most likely be successful now, majority of these patients will end up with good survival, but more than half of them will have recurrences after five years. And so it's not going to be a complete cure, but simply another way of prolonging survival with still some capacity to control the disease. And so liver transplant is feasible and most likely to be successful if the neuroendocrine tumor is only in the liver by the time the transplant is done, there's no other extrahepatic disease present. And also if the primary tumor was within the confines of the drainage of the portal venous system, meaning from the intestines mostly, the pancreas, nothing from the esophagus or the rectum or the lungs or the adrenals or thyroid or any other organs. So. Okay. That would be a very stringent criteria for a liver trust. And then there's other things like it should be well differentiated and should have stability for six months. But yes, sure. it can be done. Okay. Um, do you worry about immunosuppression after a transplant? And do we know how this affects really like recovery in, in these tumors? Well, any tumor that is indicate as an indication for transplant would always have a risk for recurrence. It's just a matter of how high that risk is. And for neuroendocrine tumor, as I mentioned, it certainly is expected to recur. So we do have a strategy to try and decrease the risk of recurrence. We just don't yet know if this is really going to make a difference, but there's certain immunosuppression that also have anti-cancer properties, anti-oncogenic properties. And so we tend to go to those kinds of immunosuppression in this setting. Perfect. Um, let me switch right over to Dr. Nakakura. What's your experience um, for liver transplant at UCSF? And where's the difference between, should I transplant someone or should I debulk someone? Um, and that comes also to the third question, which is when we talk about liver tumor burden, how does it matter? How does that play in, in your role to be able to say, I'm going to bring somebody to the operating room and actually debulk someone versus I can't do it. Uh, maybe if all the systemic therapies I use, a transplant would be a good option. Yeah, those are really great questions. I think the common um, theme of all these very complex situations is um, the importance of getting the whole team, the whole multidisciplinary team to weigh in. You know, it's not any one person making the decision. It's the, you know, the team uh, consensus. Um, I, I can say that, um, you know, every patient is a case by case basis. And um, that's why, you know, you really need to come up with an individualized plan for each patient. Um, and in some, in most situations, um, a tumor board comes with, you know, at least three recommendations that they're all pretty good, reasonable options. And it comes down to patient preference and also, um, uh, patient particular circumstances that kind of dictate which one of those three recommendations uh, rises to the top. Uh, regarding transplantation, you know, certainly that's something that's always, you know, as an option, um, as something to uh, consider. I think um, because there's so many different uh, modalities short of transplantation, such as liver-directed therapy, PRRT, surgery, um, and, you know, systemic options, um, all the transplant is an option. It's, you know, as, as, at least in my experience, it's very infrequently done. Um, at UCSF, I think um, when I asked our transplant surgeons, I think maybe only one or two had been done in memory. Um, I don't know, what, what's the experience in Chicago for transplant for neuron tumors? I think it's very similar. I think we've done right, Dr. T, may, maybe a few over the last two years, I think. I don't know exactly yes. the number. You probably know better. But... Very few, very few. It's let, probably within two or three in the last several years. And but it certainly is just, I think, something that people are getting more comfortable with at this point. And maybe something, as we probably heard in the news now that they are 
newer ways to potentially generate organs because I think organ shortage has been a real problem, right, for transplantation mm -hmm. in general. And so, um, you know, perhaps if we in the future can generate some organs, you know, that are uh, not that like immunogenic, but, but, you know, have like criteria or like characteristics of the patients and grow them, for example, in pigs, then maybe we'll get a much larger base and maybe this will be a better option, right? So I think these are, I think the future will show us where, where, where uh, things are going and where we're going to go with this. Yeah, but certainly yeah. I would say transplant is almost like the last resort. Right. You know, when you really can no longer do surgery and you've done all your treatment that you can do, and yet you still see residual tumors in both right. lobes. Right. And also yeah. important to say that the grade matters, right? So if you have a highly rapidly to, uh, growing tumor, transplantation would not be an option, obviously, right? Because, right. Uh, because you know, these tumors recur quicker than, you know, the transplant organ goes in. So um, I think that's an important point. Sorry, you're saying something else? Um, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that, that's the, always the uh, discussion is when do you decide to do it? You know, do you do it earlier um, or do you, do you do it later, right? And um, there are a lot of pros and cons for both, um, uh, uh, just, you know, options. Uh, you know, I think someone asked about, you know, uh, tumor bulk and uh, what, what makes you decide to do surgery. You know, I think this is another excellent thing about um, you know, why multidisciplinary input is so critical because, you know, as a patient, imagine that you may have a very small tumor, but in a very difficult location, or you can have a very large tumor in a very favorable location. You see how the size of the tumor may help or not help, but location may, may uh, trump size. And then if you start adding the complexity of you have, you know, some small tumors and large tumors and a mixture of good sites or bad sites and and one side or of the other side, you can see how complex the decision making can get. And this is why I think you really need to go to a place that uh, sees a lot of these and can appreciate the um, sort of nuances of all those things I mentioned. But there's not a simple rule like saying number of tumors, size of tumors, site, you know, uh, side of tumors, because all those very complex um, uh, uh, issues in, you know, interact. I think that's a really good point. Um, and I think it depends, like you said, on a lot of things, including uh, like the experience of the people uh, like that are part of your team, the experience of the surgeons, et cetera, et cetera, the experience of the radiologist, you know, who sometimes can really do um, amazing things in a much less invasive uh, way than we could um, with surgery. So I think that's a, that's a really, really good point. Um, the next question is going to be for Dr. Del Rivero. Um, how common is it for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor to mutate into a poorly differentiated net? Yeah. Thank you so much for that question, and, um, and, and, and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, so that's a very good question, and in my experience, I, I don't see that much of the differentiation. I have seen over time, like over a long period of time, I have to say over a few years, that the tumor sometimes start to behave in a little bit differently in the sense that they start seeing a more of a rapidly growing disease and a well-differentiated tumor. And in that situation, that's when I usually recommend doing a biopsy because I have seen that sometimes they differentiate a more aggressive behavior. And for me, that's important to learn because that can also guide me what will be the best treatment option in those situations as well. That's a uh, great advice. And uh, mm -hmm. let's stick with you. And a question that's sort of maybe indirectly related to that. Is it possible to revert the mutated net cell back to behaving properly? Um, in other words, to fix the wrong acting DNA of these mutated cells? Yes, I think that's not a question that nobody knows in a way, uh, unless, I mean, any of the panelists here may know that answer. I think once we see that there is a increased mutation on these tumors, it's very difficult to reverse um, in a way. Um, but again, you know, so there is some, so much that we still need to learn about tumor biology overall to help us understand. And that is a, definitely a research question and something that we need to learn more. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. T, a question that came into my mind just while we're talking about liver transplant and uh, surgery with Dr. Nakakura. Is there anything you recommend as a like hepatologist that uh, patients do in general to keep their liver healthy? So is there anything that you would say, oh, okay, 
um, if, if I have to undergo surgery or even if I don't, you know, is there anything in particular that um, I should try to avoid or how do I keep my liver healthy so it can um, undergo, you know, liver directed therapies or surgery or even a transplant, which I guess in a transplant doesn't, you know, make that much of a difference because you take the old one out and you replace it. But what about these other scenarios? Yeah, that's really important to try and see how you can make your best, uh, uh, the best um, health of your liver to combat all these um, treat, treat, treatable, but I mean, treatment, but destructive, you know, um, right. modalities, right? So I think that the easy answer, easy for me to say, may not be easy for people to do is alcohol. I mean, that really is the one thing that you could stay away from that would keep the liver from having any alcohol-related injury that may potentially uh, impair the regeneration of the liver. And the second thing would be um, try to stay healthy and avoid having a fatty liver. A fatty liver is usually a result of three things, um, excess weight, diabetes, or and really high triglycerides or cholesterol. So if you have diabetes or type cholesterol, you may want to control that really, really well to remove the excess fat that causes in the liver and then the excess weight, take care of that if you can um, to, to decrease the fat in the liver and allow regeneration again to do its job really well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I have, let's see here, another question. Um, I think that's a really interesting one. Um, for Dr. Jadira again. So um, I would love to hear more about what option exists in personalized medicine, including personalized vaccines or mutation targeting therapy. So I think what the patient is referring to is the talk we heard this morning about, you know, um, when you do molecular profiling and you do get some specific mutations, you know, in your tumor that are targetable, how experienced are we with NETs? Mm -hmm. uh, and how's the net research going into that field? And how do you think uh, the future is going to pan mm -hmm. out for that? Oh, wow. Great question. And I think there is two, I would just want to answer into two different ways. One, let's discuss about vaccines. And then the second one about targeted therapies. So in terms of the field of vaccine for neuroendocrine tumors, this is still a very evolving area and field that we're trying to study. Um, so I have to mention that there is a study that is run by Dr. Ranuka Iyer, and it's a vaccine called Survive, and a, a surviving lung peptide vaccine, and that's specifically for neuroendocrine tumors. Actually, the initial study was funded also by the NEDRF, and it's a very exciting to learn about what is the efficacy of this vaccine in neuroendocrine tumors. And the purpose of doing that is to stimulate the immune system, immune system to then determine if that could then kill the cancer cells. But again, there is an evolving area. We still don't know where it's going to fall into the treatment algorithm for neuroendocrine tumors. But the fact that we have in these treatment modalities, again, in enhance the immune system to kill the cancer is something that is definitely an exciting area to study in the field of not only neuroendocrine tumors, but as well as for other uh, cancers as well. Um, so far, there is no vaccine that is approved for neuroendocrine tumors, so that's still into studies and clinical studies. And my advice in terms of the vaccine is to then be enrolled in clinical studies to determine what will be the efficacy of this vaccine, especially for neuroendocrine tumors. Now, in terms of molecular studies or targeted therapies for neuroendocrine tumors, I think that's also an evolving field as well. It's not like, like lung cancer that we can find a molecular target that we can treat, uh, but the neuroendocrine tumors, we're still learning about that. So far until today, there is no specific mutation that we can target with treatment, um, especially for the small body bowel neuroendocrine tumors, there is not that many mutations. We actually think that it's more of a genomically bland type of tumor compared to the pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. Pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, there are in different mutations that we have understand, and, and we're trying to then, based on that biology and the molecular panel of these neuroendocrine tumors, we're then trying to target with certain treatments, but it's also an evolving field as well. So maybe a year from now, two years from now, we'll have more specific answer about that, but definitely a very good question, a very interesting question, and so much that we need to learn about neuroendocrine tumors as well to help us understand about it. Great, thank you very much. 
Uh, Dr. Nakakura, um, what do you think about uh, genomic profiling for peanuts? Do you do it routinely in your practice or you just do it when patients progress and they like run out of options? And in your experience, has it changed the management at all for patients? Yeah, <clears throat> I, can, um, I can tell you that um, you know, my colleague, Dr. Emily Bergslin at UCSF, who's a medical oncologist, um, routinely profiles uh, patients with advanced disease. Um, I think, you know, this is an evolving uh, field, and I think the more uh, data and um, information we collect over time might inform us down the line, but I think it, I think it is an evolving field and um, a very promising one in that. Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much for um, all of your participation. It was really great to see all of you. Um, I hope at some point we can do this again in person. The last two meetings have been virtual. So thank you to um, all our patients for being part of this uh, day. Uh, I hope that uh, you learned a lot. Um, I think we all had uh, really, really good speakers and really, really good uh, talks today. And I'm going to um, hand it back to the studio at this point. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, for all of you to taking the time this weekend uh, to uh, spend the time with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for spending your Sunday with us for Know Your Nets. We hope you have enjoyed this conference and learned a lot during the course of the day. A big thank you to all of our speakers for their time and participation. Thank you again to our sponsors, University of Chicago Medicine, our co-sponsor, and our educational sponsors, Ipsen, Novartis, Tercera, Lanthius, Crinetics, and Hutchmed. We appreciate your support. We truly hope that we can meet with you next year in person. In the meantime, stay safe. Thank you so much for being with us today and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Mm -hmm.